el Sainla, the new graduate school of design at the Universidad de Bolivares. We're extremely happy and proud of uh, proud of um, having all of you here uh, visiting us. Uh, it's a fantastic second round that started yesterday at the Universidad de Desarrollo. We have a lecture from uh, our guest, special guest Raúl Mendoza. Uh, and today we're going to have a second round, which is going to be around the topic of urban design and planning, especially around education and research on this topic. Uh, this second round is called uh, Conversations on Urban Design and Planning, and I would like to start by thanking the people that made this meeting possible. Um, of course, I would like to uh, thank Harvard University, uh, especially the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, uh, Marcela Ramos. Um, one of the representatives of uh, uh, Dr. Klaas in Chile, she's a manager of regional office and she, she will uh, say a few words to you in a few minutes. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Universidad de Desarrollo and Paolo Lark, uh, key partners uh, in this joint venture in bringing Raul and all of you here today to discuss this relevant topics for Chile. Also, I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, UAE, uh, Carlos Busquets and Andrea, uh, that have been responsible for setting this up and having all of us here. Uh, very special thanks to Codel Juan Calama Plus, who are our host for this trip. Uh, this is a long, intense visit for Raul, and our team uh, started yesterday with a lecture. Today we have a discussion, and then we're moving from here to north of Chile, where we're going to be visiting Calama and Chiquicamata. So this is just part of an exciting uh, beginning of a collaboration that we think is going to trigger all kinds of interesting uh, outcomes. Um, but most especially, I would like to thank Rahul. Uh, he's our guest uh, speaker today. We're going to have three presentations, and Rahul is going to be our guest uh, presenter. Rahul Merota is professor of urban design and planning at uh, Harvard University. He's also chair of the Department of Urban Design and Planning. He's a practicing architect, and a, an urban designer, and an educator. His firm, RNA Architects, was founded in 1990 in Mumbai and has designed and executed projects for clients that include government and non-governmental agencies, corporate as well as private individuals and institutions. Merotra has written and lectured extensively on issues to do with architecture, conservation, urban planning in Mumbai and India, and he has published more than 16 books. His current research involves looking at India's medium-sized cities and the broad and emerging patterns of urbanism in India. Rotra's ongoing research is focused on evolving a theoretical framework for designing on conditions of informal growth. What he refers to as the kinetic city. He, he will probably talk about this uh, during his presentation today. He has run several studios looking at various aspects of planning questions in the city of Mumbai and under the rubric of extreme urbanism. Rotra is a member of the steering committee of the South Asia Initiative at Harvard and curates their series of urbanization. He currently is leading a university-wide research project called the Kum Men, Mapping in the Ephemeral City. Today, we're going to have three presentations. First, uh, Paolo Alar, Dean of the School of Architecture and Art from the University of Desarrollo, uh, who did his PhD at Harvard University, is going to be presenting. Uh, then, Luis Valenzuela, also a alumni from Harvard University, did his PhD there in urban design and the director of the Center for Territorial Intelligence here at the Design Lab. And then Raul, of course, is going to uh, show us uh, his work. This is a very uh, exciting moment for all of us. This is a fantastic moment to discuss these topics. This year is going to be key for Chile in terms of education. We have a month-old new government in place, and the key word is education. So discussing how these topics, how urbanism, how the cities, how architects and designers are trained to think and uh, design the present and the future of our cities is something that is of absolute uh, relevance today. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Marcela Ramos uh, and then uh, give a strong welcome to our uh, speakers. I hope you enjoy it. The idea of this is that this is going to be more than a set of presentations around uh, the discussion. We want to have brief presentations so that everybody can participate and join in the, in the conversation. We want to like, we would like to hear uh, opinions from, from all the different uh, people that are, that are here uh, today as guests. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. Thank you for the introduction. 
introductory class is to promote the collaborations between Harvard and local institutions. And that's why we're very interested in doing things in collaboration with universities here locally. Um, I want to invite you all. I left some uh, handouts there uh, to explore a little bit more the programs we do. And uh, we have many things for faculty and students uh, to be involved and to promote this collaboration between both uh, these institutions and Harvard. So please be in touch with us and with me particularly if you have any interest on uh, different things that we do. Um, I, I think it's going to be very helpful today to go around the table and just introduce ourselves very shortly, 30 seconds, each of us. Uh, so Rahul can get a sense of who is here sitting and joining the conversation today. So uh, I started already and uh, will continue this way. Uh, before that, I just want to say thank you to Universidad Alfiane and to Universidad del Desarrollo. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to do this with you and I hope we'll continue our collaboration uh, in the coming years. And Raul, of course, thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Felipe Vera. Uh, I'm a professor here at the Design Lab uh, of Universidad of Valles, and also I, I teach with Raúl at the GSD in the Department of Urban Planning and Design. I'm Fernando Pérez, I'm a professor at the Catholic University. I'm currently running the doctorate in Architecture and Urban Studies. <coughs> Jonathan Barton of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development, which is an initiative between the Catholic University and the University of Constitution. <coughs> My name is Alberto Texido. I come from the University of Chile. I'm working now in infrastructure relationship with, uh, between the city and the port, basically. I'm happy to be here and uh, I hope to learn more things. Sergio, yeah. thank you. You already introduced me. <laughs> <laughs> I am Thomas Foltz, I'm a faculty at the Design Lab of the University of Uranus. My name is Nicole Rodin, I teach here in the University of Dolphin Divides, and I'm part of the Central Computer Curriculum Campus. My name is Julian Azar, I'm from the University of Desarrollo, I'm a Bureau Professor of Theory and History of Bureau Practice. My name is Concha Lugao, I'm a Harvard resident from the MLA program and community. I'm a professor at the Catholic University when we started the landscape architecture program. And I also currently have my office as well. Combined both. Hi, my name is Ricardo Dufel. I'm geographer and magister in geography and thematics. And I'm a professor of the design lab. Hi, I'm Daniel Vasco. I'm a the Department of Architecture at the University of Chile. Well, and I am Paolo Lago. And then Luis is going to introduce or trigger the discussion in terms of uh, research. How can we understand the CDs, the patterns, and, and so on? So we're going to just uh, leap through and then we're going to leave Rahul and we're going to open the discussion. So, in terms of planning in Chile, since we're here. Uh, education and, and planning came pretty early in Chile from the hand of guys like Karl Brunner on the 20s, uh, from the Bayes school, bringing this idea of scientific urbanism and planning. And Santiago is one of the, I would say, mostly planned cities I've ever uh, known in, 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 in Latin America, even though Chileans tend to complain, but the influence of his work, particularly at the Universidad de Chile, with uh, Muñoz Maruska and the whole school that derived from, from, from his early work in Chile and influence, not only in Chile but also Colombia, was long before the modern movement and people like uh, Le Corbusier, the Sion guys, and particularly Walter Gropius started influencing planning with all this uh, frame, uh, mind frame of uh, zoning and, 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 and planning from top down with these massive interventions that even in Chile had 
uh, a quite in interesting impact in, 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 in the work of the Corby and Cormu during the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And with those huge urban renovation projects that ended up uh, uh, being challenged by the end of the 60s and mid uh, 70s by new discourses that started uh, on one hand thinking on other structures and this comes uh, right at the moment of this epistemological break that happens from 68 on in the discussion of uh, of the structures that uh, create uh, the institutions, the frameworks, the policies and uh, challenged on one hand by people like John Turner uh, realizing and visualizing the importance of the informal and the progressive and the participation in the process of planning and design of housing and on the other hand the Team 10 and all their reaction to the CM. And it's interesting that after that uh, what Hashim Sarkis uh, professor at Harvard calls this line between procedures and aesthetics in the discourse and the rhetoric of urban planning and design sort of like derived in, in two ways. On one hand, uh, Collapse City was a quite influential piece of work. The, the, the work of the Venturi is kind of like showing that there's some bizarre ways of planning and doing urbanism that are as valuable as the traditional ways. And then Cole has later on with uh, the Lewis New York kind of like bringing up the values of metropolitanist uh, culture, the cultural of, of congestion and so on, sort of like created a tension that went in different ways and kind of like uh, distorted a little bit the, the, the way to approach uh, design. On one hand, the new urbanists with this idea of coding, regulating everything, trying to come back to the traditional but that traditional is kind of like something that neglects any relation with the, lo the local and, and the identity and, and the self-determination of the families and the dwellers. And on the other hand, this promise, this failed promise of metropolitanism that even Cole has failed in Lille, as we have seen. Uh, and then the business as usual of the cities, their developments, the whole idea of urban renewal that came uh, on, on the late 80s in the States, like in Baltimore's war for uh, this idea of urbanism by projects that uh, emerged in, in Barcelona in the 90s and sort of like started uh, creating more tension into this equation. And we were in the middle of this when suddenly this confusion led to the landscapers to take over the city in certain ways. Landscape urbanism became a big issue. And later on, this whole idea and promise of sustainability, with great promises and failures, like Dong Tang, Echo City in China by Aru. And on the other hand, some cases that are quite interesting, <coughs> like Borneo, Borneo's Pannenburg, or this case that is Hammarby, Hochstadt in uh, Stockholm in, in Sweden, where you see that the pragmatism and the idea, idealism, if it's aligned with a social project, if it's aligned with, um, with, 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 with some vision of social justice, development, and democracy, can lead to a certain promise of urbanization. These are kind of like, this is like a very, 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 very short story of uh, urban design and planning for dummies. You're not dummies, but it's just a trivial discussion. But then what was happening? What was happening in the meanwhile was this. We were not conscious of the kind of, of, of city, of the kind of uh, dwelling or communities we were building. We were lost on discourses, high level discourses on. And in the meanwhile, and this is not Photoshop, this is a quite famous picture of Paraisopolis in Sao Paulo, one of the uh, most famous favelas next to one of the highest income uh, neighborhoods in, in Sao Paulo. It's kind of like the picture of the problem that we're facing as urban planners and designers today. We have become too slow <coughs> in the way we produce and, and the way we, uh, we respond to the new demands, emerging demands. We have lost power and influence by the hand of other disciplines that are on one hand, 
much more efficient on the procedural aspects and on the other hand architects were lost on the aesthetics discussions and not necessarily framing both. But there are some opportunities that come from this, uh, and I would say uh, we're lucky that we haven't reached development yet, particularly in the global south, because uh, that helps us to solve some questions and address these issues in new ways. Just to be brief, most Latin American cities have higher income, medium income, than the country itself. We have urbanized already. About 80 or 85 percent of the population in Latin America is urban. And that population is becoming rich. And most urban dwellers in Latin America will be middle class by, uh, by the end of this decade, probably. And um, that is challenging in a certain way. The, the provision of services, the access to the opportunities that governments and city planners uh, have to deal with. Uh, the, 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 the demands of the society are, are, have changed. Um, Chileans are absolutely crazy about the access to things they never had. We, are the, we have the highest uh, con, uh, consumo, um, consumption. consumption of ice cream in Latin America, we, have the, we are the second in Latin America and in the world in terms of Coca-Cola per capita drinking. Uh, we, you, each of you guys drink uh, 486 bottles of Coke or, or soft drinks uh, a year. Uh, so, 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 so things have changed. We were poor, but now we have access to goods that are part of the, uh, the promise of development and, and, and even, and this is a map that Ricardo Lucho, uh, Nicole and I did some time ago, even, even the social structure of the city is changing. It's not concentrated now in segregated areas, it's kind of like mixing over, following the opportunities provided by transportation, following the opportunities provided by, by, by sub-centers. But the problem is that, and that is why some uh, peripheral communities now think they rock. And, 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 and that's the case of America. But the problem is that not government, not planners, but others were there before to address the emerging demands of the communities, the families, that emerging middle class, <coughs> and without any conscious planning and coherence related to the city. And those are the retailers and the malls, and that is why I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this, but this used to be just a shopping mall that happened to be in the verge, in the limit between the emerging city, Plaza Vespucio, and the traditional city. And it started mm -hmm. providing services that were not related to a mall. There's a free museum, two libraries, <coughs> an academic institution, uh, Duoc, technical school, Church. soccer fields, uh, a lot of like public goods that were meant to be provided by the public were addressed by private developers and retailers because no one else was doing it. And it's not a problem of Santiago, it's also a problem in Concepcion, it's also a problem in Castro, Valparaiso, and so on. We haven't been able to grasp the trends, follow that, and answer, bring answer to those emerging demands, and someone else did. Mm. And that's part of our failure. And on the other hand, we left behind thousands of families on the periphery, on the ghettos, without the provision of public goods, safety, access to transportation that led to the failure of the transportation system in cities like Santiago. Because we know that transportation is key to bring access to those opportunities. And then, on the other hand, this economic growth is leading to this love for the car, access and passion for the car, and now we have this emerging problems and discussions about congestion and how to deal with uh, congestion. So it, 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 it's a quite complex scenario. We have some uh, problems from the first world and some other issues from the third world that collide and get together. We have an emerging social civic society that is demanding not only access to better education, 
free education, but also better seas, better public spaces. <laughs> and they are proactive. And they are promoting ideas. The community, it's after years of dictatorship in Chile, it's now strong enough and confident <laughs> enough to take the streets to address all these ideas of tactic urbanism, recover lost spaces, participatory design. And citizens are becoming and moving <coughs> from passive observers to active protagonists and taking over. And where have we been? This emerging society, also it's good to customize. They love to customize, they, they pimp up their cars, but they also customize their homes. They, are, they have this energy to customize and, 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 and to adapt and to add value to their goods, as we have seen in the work of Elementar and Rahul was in Renka, where participation and the beauty is not at the beginning, but during the whole process, in order to add value and incorporate that. And on the other hand, the amazing challenges we face with new technologies. And this is just an example I'm going to show you, if you remember this guy. Faunas, the Chileans, uh, this is like when, when cell phones spread all over. I'm about to finish. And the, the massive use of smartphones, even in, in, even in different social conditions, in different uh, areas of the city and so on, has completely changed the relation between the user, the citizen, and the planners, the service providers, and the authorities. I'm just going to give you an example. This is Dani Zapata, and this is a real story I just uh, got from, 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 from Twitter. Uh, she's writing to the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, Trans Santiago. And she said, hey friends from San Trans Santiago, please, but really please, could you improve the frequency of, uh, of, of, of the bus 345 in <coughs> Two days, the bus is packed, it, 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 gets, uh, it breaks down, and, and, and I'm really desperate. Just one minute after, I'm sorry, Trans Santiago, the Twitter operator of the Metropolitan Transportation System, says, Hi Danny, 345, that, that one doesn't run through Vitacura. And she answers, Oops, sorry, it's 435 from Kilicura to Vitacura. Trans Santiago answers, I knew it. <laughs> smile, smile, the, 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 the system is smiling to you. A bus is coming, right at this moment. ZN5300 will let Alsacia, the private operator, concessionary of the buses, to check the frequency. And now she answers. Trans Santiago, I'm already in the bus. But please, Alsacia, the operator, could you please do something? This is too much. It goes every hour, 45 minutes. So it is in immediacy. And you think this is enough? No! <laughs> then Alsacia answers. <laughs> and he says, thank you, Danny. Yes, we're going to check what's going on there. Uh, goodbye. And Danny says, great. Uh, no, and Santiago says, great. Please, Danny, have a safe trip. And then Danny's friend <laughs> says, Danny, are you okay? <laughs> so, so this immediacy, this this kind of like flattening of 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 of, of the man's communication reactions between the the, the the physical and let's say digital or whatever is completely challenging the way we will have to address planning and design. And on the other hand, going back to equity, going back to, I'm sorry, uh, we we're not going to talk about this whole problem of, of congestion. Uh, this is nothing compared to Mumbai or uh, but Santiago is also becoming a quite complex place to, to move around. Uh, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. I mean, we're not going to solve these things by flying saucers. Why? Because in our countries we're going to be uh, trying to follow Amazon and, and trying to get the Christmas present. Uh, but the other aspect where we can do a lot is not only through technology, not only through physical planning, but management. 
And, and, and that's something, urban management is something that we should address as well, because that gets straight to the heart of people. This is a family from Puente Alto. Puente Alto is one of the biggest and uh, emerging uh, areas of Santiago's periphery. About 5,000 people live there, but most of them work somewhere else, downtown Santiago, higher income communities, and they don't have time to do any errands, to do any paperwork during the uh, regular office hours because they're working somewhere else. And the municipality, just by changing the way they provide public services, let's say uh, the office for, for registering, paying your bills and so on, and by opening late at night, have completely changed the relation and the access of these families to those provision of services. And now these families, after work, they can go to the municipality and apply for a subsidy or whatever and have a, a, a better way to approach. This is not a solution. This is just a fixture, momentary fixture, but tells a lot about how we need to address by planning, by design, and also by policy, address all these challenging issues of the urban future. Just to finish, <coughs> this is not going to happen. It never happened. It never happened. Even in the 80s with Blake Runner, it didn't happen. <laughs> and cars won't fly. So let's stop thinking about all these postcards of the future. They will drive themselves. They will adjust, they will optimize uh, things. And we're going to start sharing. We're going to start changing some paradigms. And we're doing it now in Chile. And there's a lot of other guys who are doing it already in Germany and so on. And that creates a certain, let's say, optimistic view that we will start cultivating another way of relating to the city, not only in the wealthier parts, but also on some of the poorest areas of our cities. So if we are able to detect, respond to these emerging demands and trends, if we are able to innovate in governance, in infrastructure, planning and provision services and mobility, maybe we'll be able to improve and address and live in more sustainable, equitable, resilient and efficient cities. Thank you very much. Uh, a personal effort, but much more a team effort. Uh, many of the people that work with me are here. Uh, Nicole and Ricardo are sitting right here, and also there's a bunch of people right there. Uh, which has uh, been able to bring this what we're going to see possible. Uh, I excuse myself from because uh, some of you have already seen a portion of this presentation or the whole of it, especially Antonio, which helped me shape it uh, when I visited him in Washington uh, and uh, had a meeting with Anne Pendleton and went through very carefully all these slides, so uh, sorry for that. This presentation only wants to trigger discussion in a certain way, so I will uh, go even faster than what Rahul did, uh, what did his presentation yesterday. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, translation, so that's good. <laughs> and I have a timekeeper. And I hope to answer this question, what has to do a bathtub and a nice cute tray in building up evidence for the city of contemporary problems of our territory. Um, and yes, what we talked with Rahul was in part that planning needs to have commitment. What this is, as this march in front of La Moneda or Government Palace, is actually asking commitment on planning. And what has that to do with urban planning, territorial planning, architecture, and design strategy is a whole uh, set of questions. And there was a point of, um, not a starting point, but a point of, of convergency, and which we started a lot of what we are doing now as research, was when we did uh, some of the plans that Pablo showed. Specifically, uh, this is one I think um, I saw from Pablo Vanco around here, <coughs> right there. Um, uh, a person related to him helped us build this plan about where did the uh, manifestation, this was when I was in Versailles uh, Catolica, in which parts of the city did manifestations happen? Um, and this was 2006, this was the first uh, school, rebel, uh, school 
manifestations on the city. Um, huh? Revolution today, I would say. Um, and we articulated this graphic expression, graphic and visualization in each part of the city where uh, people ask for formal government permission to do a manifestation in the city and then you see the circles. This was graphically built also with Daniel Faso here in that time. Um, and Bob already showed this plan also, which was another of the com very convergent uh, plans and very illustrative to us to uh, how to synthesize some problems and interpret and, and link in a certain, eco what we're calling now an ecology of problems. Not only the rich here are more red, and you see all the red in the concentration, but also what uh, we think it's interesting is that actually, oops, <coughs> what did I do? Wow. Uh, but actually that there are transport corridors, um, like this one, like this one, like this one, in which all these blue dots come together, and those are the supermarkets where people buy food. Whatever income you have, if it is 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, you need to buy food. And actually where you have these corridors, you have a greater income, and you have the supermarkets. And then you have lower income, but then in that lower income you have, you know, these green worms. Those are the street markets. Those are the places where people with less income are buying their food. So this builds up not only for detecting where uh, wealth is located in the city, but actually how the city works as an ecology, as a whole system, uh, whether it's good or bad. We have one, gone on with a lot of uh, research in that sense, trying to understand where parts of the city do you have uh, accessibility to services and equipment, mm -hmm. and how that, that service makes you more equal between citizens or less equal between citizens. These are finally after hours pharmacies that you can access if your child is ill and you can get there with a distance of 45 minutes at night. And there's a lot that says that you need to have it all covered up the city and of course uh, the gray areas don't do that. We have gone also on trying to understand uh, uh, prospecting into the city to see where the subcenters are going to come according to accessibility, according to time that you can travel and investment in infrastructure. The, uh, uh, in that sense, the black uh, dots are the existing subcenters, and the red dots are subcenters that we're trying to explore if they're going to happen in some way or not. And this is actually talking about a place on the city that is not fixed, but that is moving itself. It's, it's flexible. And in that sense, it was very marked for us, or for me, um, uh, a small article of James Corner, Terra Fluxus, that we also talked with Rahul in a certain point. He's a landscaper, he talks about the flexibility, uh, all flexibility of landscape, how it moves itself. We saw this camp, you know, in uh, Kumpa Yes? Um, and how it comes into a river, forms itself, shapes itself, and goes out. This is a cartography of the Mississippi River that Consuelo Bravo showed me a couple of years ago. And it's amazing how, uh, the, during the years, the flooding and how the terrain and the, the whole uh, situation of the river moves itself in the territory. Uh, so everything that we have in planning in a certain way, pre-established, scientifically layered, as you have to analyze circulation, texture, building heights, etc., sets your judgment to that understand cities and understand certain contexts that today, what um, James Gardner said is not valid. You have to go into the site and understand it right from the beginning. Another person that has been very striking on, uh, for us and for me to understand that is actually uh, Michael Steinberg. And he talks about not uh, to go to a task for a specific need itself. Uh, that will be a client that comes to you and says, you know, I need a house like this, or I need a master plan like that, or I need Kalama Plus in this way. But actually that you have to step back in a certain way, ask the correct questions. And this is what we're calling today um, or what we like to call the ecology of a problem, try to understand all the variables that come into a problem. And some of those variables will go into a design, will go into a strategy, or will simply go into a process. And then you will have uh, a better synthesis and uh, a better uh, array of solutions. In that sense, it's like pushing back uh, into a back frontier, a, a, a back a trench, not right in the front, but actually to advance, you have to uh, walk a little bit uh, towards the back. It's like Michael Jackson walking. <laughs> How do we do that in the city? And there, here comes the bath and the, the bathtub and the ice cream. And this has been, it, it looks, it, it is a very bad metaphor, but it helps me quite a lot. Um, and in fact, yesterday when Rahul uh, showed, and you don't see it very well here, but 
a photograph of Mumbai and a photograph or a photograph of New York. And Raoul was talking about the whole uh, small parts that are around the city here. Those are like these very small ice cubes uh, trays that you have in the city. Each one of them works with a certain range of distance and influences and impacts in that way. On the other hand, you have Central Park in New York that is a great bathtub. It's immense, huge by its size, and impacts by both sides, by that effect as a gravitational, a huge Jupiter planet in this system. The city, as we see it, or the territory as we see it, work both ways. They add up the bathtub and the uh, ice cube tray in a certain way. And we have tried to go on measuring stuff like that and setting standards and understanding how accessible are things for people equipment and services in that term, as a bathtub and an ice cube tray. This is the small plazas, the small squares that are very close to your neighborhood that you can go every day when you come back from work with your kids. And this is the huge metropolitan park in the center or in another part of the city that you go on the weekend or once a month. And both build our ways and our living and our accessibility to uh, places in Chile. Uh, this is a, there's a whole process in how to understand that index, how to understand each one of the squares if they are linked to one uh, a green area or not in some squares that actually are very close to both of them. And this has to do by distance, by time, you know, three squares, four squares, 900 meters, one kilometer, but also psychology. What is the distance that I can tell my kid, okay, go to the plaza, but I still in my unconscious feel safe on sending him to the plaza? Is three squares? More or less, more than three squares, I, I, I don't feel safe for him to go there. So there's a whole uh, modeling of the city in that sense and also with services to it. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, understanding of how people live in the city, how they behave in the city, you can come up with a number that has a meaning to that and has a, a, a whole setting to that. And then you can put it into communities. This is a municipal administration. And then you can put the, you know, that, uh, that number. But then you can go back and you can commit on planning to that. You can say, okay, I have a specific area which is uh, underestimated in that. You don't have enough classes to go after work and, and with your kids and play there. And we have been going with that uh, for green areas, uh, sports equipment. Uh, this is transportation, as Pablo already mentioned. And we have been measuring already uh, 12 cities in, in, uh, in Chile in all these uh, sequences. And we have uh, asked ourselves, what should we do with this information? And the first step for that, we have been nurturing information to some web pages, which third parties actually developed. One is Talk, Talk uh, another one, Mi Antonio. And part of the engines that are behind uh, information that is behind these engines is information and it's research that we have been doing and updating permanently uh, to that. And this, the intent for this is actually to put it on the web open to the public, not in an academic term, but actually uh, in the ways that people that deal with web and you know, community sharing networks as Paulo uh, was uh, telling us uh, not to do and, and <coughs> our links to. Here you can put your address, your neighborhood, and much of this data will appear in, uh, packed up in a, in a different way. But there's other concerns that I could actually cannot go into a web page and we have worked very hard. Segregation. Segregation is very difficult, it's very easy to understand, but definitely very difficult to put in spatial terms. Actually, to pinpoint segregation in a map and to understand how it spatially behaves has been a whole, uh, 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 a whole uh, challenge. Here you have the same city, but if you, if you cut the city in different ways, you have a complete segregated city or complete integrated city. But it's the same city. The same black dots and white dots in the same distribution, spatial <coughs> distribution. And if you cut the city to your analysis in a different way, then the results will be very different. How you do that segregation in a city of Santiago, for example, when the lower income is distributed this way? Do you do it by municipality? Do you do it by north, south, east, west? Clusters? So we went on with this problem. We took nine squares my blocks in any city with different income, uh, median income, and we started analyzing not the uh, segregation inside the city, which is this house to this house, which is the house the neighbor on your back, but actually the segregation on the front, on the street, on the public space. And we compare each one of these uh, streets 
front to front and try to understand the level of segregation in terms of income in this place. And we mapped the whole city and we drew again a spatial index on the axis of the public space. And with that, we can actually redraw the city in terms of its segregation. And we come up with a drawing like this. When you have integration, which is this uh, gray and also this, uh, this white, and, this, and then you have uh, high, uh, low income segregation here. And you have ghettos. And which place is this one? Which place is this one? Para de lo which is, and I knew Paolo was going to show it, so it was <laughs> counting on that, is this spot. This whole neighborhood that has exploded the south periphery of Santiago, but actually is that spot, and next to it we have this very high uh, concentration of lower income segregation. And we don't know what that happens. We don't understand the ecology of that problem still yet, and how we don't understand how it behaves in spatial terms. A good friend of mine, the economist, Daniel Lochman, told me, but you know, Luis, this is very interesting, but it has been done. 1890, London. Uh, and uh, a man from London uh, went traveling, walking through all the streets for 10 years, putting uh, income in each one of the streets. And actually to understand the relationship between income and uh, criminality, especially these uh, green, um, sorry, uh, blue areas, were lower class, vicious, semi-criminal. Hmm. And then you have the Buckingham Palace, which of course was upper middle, upper class wealthy, <laughs> not criminal. <clears throat> so this has been done, and this was a very um, uh, good to see, very challenging to see. What we wanted to know there uh, was actually how these all uh, integrate or a heterogeneous set of, of, of a piece of the city as London in that time, how that behaved in Santiago. What was the drawing of Santiago in those same terms? This is the result. One third of our population in Santiago, two million people live in highly concentrated, segregated, low-income areas. They occupy 25% of our urban area. <coughs> All the ghettos detected in Santiago are inside one of these very vast areas, as you see here. We have, sorry for the light, but we have the high income segregation, which is a voluntary segregation, and it's always much more concentrated. And actually, it's so concentrated that it explains a lot of our income in, um, in product per capita, actually. If you take out the 1% or the 0.1% of income in Chile, how that goes down. But then we have the other reality, and how we go and put some evenness on that between those two parts of the city. This is another site on the, on the, on the south of the city of Santiago. And we can understand how you have segregation here because you have a highway, so that's a natural physical barrier. But we don't understand what segregation, why that is happening there. What are the, 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 what are the, the aspects that are changing this? Is it going smaller? Is it expanding? Those are the bunch of questions that we are looking for. And of course, as Booth did in London with this vicious criminals, uh, we also wanted to go with that, with criminality. And research in criminality is always where you have a criminal act happening, where someone assaults you. Um, and there's a whole, you know, things on Boston about criminality and a whole uh, mathematical modeling of where criminality happens even in downtown Santana. And actually many of the research is on that place where a criminal act happens, a felony happens. Many uh, research is on the uh, police work, on the judge and judicial work, and then the guy goes to jail, he's condemned. So everything, everybody applauds, and we put the lights off, and the problem is solved. But that person that is a felon actually lived in a place where there's a whole social network. There's a whole family, there's kids living there. And somehow, as a society, could we say that we produce criminality in a certain way? Or does our physical context explain or foster criminality in a certain way or not? Does it or does it not? So that was uh, something that we wanted to ask us. So actually to break up this criminal uh, cycle. And actually the penitentiary system was very interested in this uh, and is very interested in this kind of, of research. Because they have to, when these felons uh, do their, uh, their, their jail time, they have to go back to their neighborhoods. 
and where do you go back? So we had uh, several questions, the what if, is there, which, what, etc. about all these phenomena in the city. So the penitentiary system gave us the data of the neighborhoods and the address of the criminals by June 31 of 2011 in Santiago. city of Santiago. With, with that photograph in that shot, we're now going to expand this in a historical to see how it moves out. And this is how we compare it to our segregation. And it starts to group itself in a certain way. And here we color it up in each one of the places. And then, can we understand segregation and criminality or not? Can you do that in an ethical way? Can you understand and try to link that and try to, try to achieve a more understanding of this, what we call the ecology of the problem. By our surprise, two-thirds of it are in of criminals, uh, residents, or home of crime as we call it, are in low-income areas. And another third is in integrated areas. We went on analyzing what kind of felonies happen. We wanted to know if there existed neighborhoods of murderers, neighborhoods of thieves. Is there a specialization in the city about that? Is there a learning about it? Is there, do our cities, our schools, are the streets, our schools of criminality or not? So the penitentiary system has a, a whole survey that they try to understand criminal compromise. As more compromised you are, you're more in depth to the criminal activity. And we try to map that. This is the lower compromise. These are the guys that are going into, just stepping into criminal activity. And then there's the medium, and that's the high. And it's completely mixed. Our city, in a certain sense, combines these different levels of uh, home of crime in, in it. But the 10% of higher uh, compromised criminals are located in these areas. And this, this is astonishing. For one, none of them is in the ghetto. And for two, most of them are inside the ring road. Another small example of this is when we worked with the municipality of Peñalolé in that spot of Santiago. And we went on trying to understand schools and how school behavior uh, and the absence of uh, kids into public schools, which are the red dots, um, and uh, how that behaved with criminal activity. So we had uh, the red dots of public schools in this municipality. We are right here now, right in that spot. Um, and then this is assault uh, density in the city. This is uh, assault that happens in the street. So it's very much on the highways, on the, on the most uh, traffic uh, roads. But then this is road traffic. And this has to do with neighborhoods close to schools. Is this one and that one. And we took this school, Santa Maria, and tried to analyze that spot, which half of the students were in a very concentrated uh, activity of drug, uh, activity of drug uh, delinquency. And we asked for the, uh, the municipality to give us all that data, and we filtered the data by the time of entrance of school and time of going out of school. So the, the, these are the reports, police reports of drug activity on that time frame. On the time frame where kids have to get to school and go out of school. We asked them the address of all the kids, those uh, black dots, and we run uh, the most rational a path from their home to the school and the concentration of flows. And as more red it goes, more concentration of flow you have to that school. And the school is right on this very uh, curious L shape. The school is right here. There's a plaza right in this spot. So all this neighborhood here is blocked actually by a row of houses and the school is behind it. So many of the kids around this have to take that path, that red path there in that point. And here you see it with the density of crime uh, reports. There's the L of the school in that spot. <coughs> and here we don't see nothing. Um, so here's the school right there. This is the road houses that block the school. And all this neighborhood is under that uh, drug activity. And here we have a zoom out. There's a school and this is the block there. And all the kids that have to go there. None of the kids actually go this way and turn around into the school. They actually go into the criminal activity. So our suggestion, our a sense of compromise, sense of link between this understanding of this 
uh, ecology of the problem and a commitment of planning that we talked about uh, was actually uh, an advice for the municipality to buy one of, or two of these houses and just demolish it. So you can give an alternative of a pathway to the school not going through the criminal activity of drug dealing in this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Is I'm just going to offer a couple of minutes of comments on what was presented. Then I'm going to share with you just some experiences from India uh, because I think that will help uh, you understand my position and my uh, perspective. But also because I, and I've been saying to Masala now for a few months since we met, that I think it's important for us to share in the Global South our experiences. And so I think just to share with you some things and observations from India, I think would be useful. Some things I covered yesterday, so excuse me for the repetition. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline, I think, five or six points from a pedagogical perspective. That is a challenge for urban design, urban studies, which will, I think, hopefully lead us into the roundtable discussion. So that's the way I am structuring this. The last two presentations are just the, the ideas that were going through my mind in terms of responses I just wanted to share. Uh, one was that uh, I think when Paolo sort of talked about the overview, the one thing that struck me and I was saying to him was that a lot of the failures and a lot of the observations about the trends of what we call urban design or that emerges as models of urban design uh, are really the landscapes of indulgence waterfront developments and the high line when we talk about landscape urbanism. So I was very happy to hear that with an MAUD degree and an MLA degree, you're trying to do something in landscape because I think how those disciplines confront this condition is where the new theories will arrive. Uh, a lot of what we are even in our urban studies using today are theories that came out of the industrializing West, which got extended all the way from the garden city idea to industrialization and the modernization project uh, and all of that. And similarly in landscape and other disciplines, uh, uh, I think a lot of this is yet situated in the developed global north. Uh, and so how it gets challenged where the action is on the ground, which is in Asia and Latin America, I think uh, the big responsibility and challenge for us is to then reflect on those actions to construct new forms of theory. And I think that is the very exciting project that the dialogue in the Global South uh, can offer to all of us as professionals. So that was one thing that struck me in that uh, in that presentation. And I think then when Luis talked about technology, on the other hand, it's like a bookend to what I'm going to talk about. You know, I was thinking, I only recently learned that in, in America or in American cities, the ambulances are like a, a omnipresent soundscape in our minds because they're very efficient. The ambulance always gets somewhere very quickly. I only learned recently that they don't have a fixed parking spot. Uh, the ambulances are, they keep shifting. So if one ambulance goes on an emergency call, all the other ambulances reconfigure themselves so the distance in terms of coverage becomes equal again. And that is possible through technology. So it's a dynamic, kinetic kind of space, uh, which is where I think technology becomes really beautiful. And the example of the blog for the bus uh, and all of that tells us that it is, it's not just the Mississippi or the terra firma in the landscape definition, but there is this kind of landscape that we live in, which is the soft city which is reconfiguring itself all the time. And this, again, would be an interesting question in planning uh, terms. And I'll come back to this and I'll frame five or six questions which I think could be important. But what I'm going to share with you first to start with is just my observations on what I call the kinetic city. I'm going to go through this fast just to familiarize you with some images. If you look at South Asia and India at the turn of our independence, it's very interesting that in this map uh, only about uh, 20 cities appear, that means including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So what was India under the British? And there was French India, there was Portuguese India, uh, because these were different small colonies. But there were only about 25 cities, 100, 500,000 was the biggest, etc. 
within 45 years of our kind of uh, independence, the explosion is amazing. Now we might even have 400 cities with 1 million people each. So it's incredible how much that population of the urban has increased. And this is yet only 50% urban. India is not going to be more than 50% urban even in the next 30 years. And in spite of that, we are going to have something like 450 cities with over a million people. So it's mind-boggling what that change is going to be. Some cities like Mumbai have grown where they've added 1 million people every 10 years in a sense, over 30 years, and they grow by 3 million people like that. Now what happens in that case is that planning becomes reactive, uh, because it's, it can only be reactive, it can't be forward thinking, because you can't keep up the planning culture to the rate of growth, uh, and that becomes an important question. So what you're doing in the condition, often in Latin America, Mexico, uh, but in India especially, is you're only managing growth. You're not uh, actually ahead of the growth, you're managing growth as it happens. And so, in my reading, I call this the kinetic city because that's a very particular urban condition. Uh, I'm sorry, is that, can we actually adjust? Is, is that really? Yeah. I think it has too much contrast. It has maybe too much. Can I just suggest? It? I can try. Yeah. Only if there's a lot of other slides, won't be really well. <coughs> So you have this very particular condition as a result of this where you have you know, what we call the informal and the formal city, but again, I think we have to challenge that definition because as I was talking yesterday, I believe that the binary of setting up the formal and informal is for us as designers and planners and people dealing with space, a non-productive binary because it makes us lay our alliance and that beautiful image that Paolo showed from Caracas, I think it was, or with a swimming pool and the, yeah. Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo, sorry, Sao Paulo. That shows the kind of binary, but it's non-productive because what happens and that's happening in our community of professionals is now we have architects who engage with the informal city and we have architects who engage with the formal city. But really we should be as professionals thinking how we can dissolve those binaries. And so the binary as a narrative that we construct, I believe is non-productive. And I think this is another challenge for us uh, as professionals. And of course, in the case of India, we had the legacy of modernism, Chandigarh, uh, where the state was very central to the planning project. And I think that raises another question, that if you don't have the patronage of the state for planning, what does it mean and what does urban design mean? And I think this again goes to Paolo's sort of question, because in really societies of advanced capitalism, urban design became big architecture, because it was the private enterprise that was developing cities, and they were hiring landscape architects and urban designers. The state began to devolve its responsibility. So this becomes a very huge question for pedagogy how we use technology and otherwise uh, for planning. In the case of India, for example, this blur exists at many levels. So here you see this temple. The temple is a neutral institution that actually dissolves that binary between these two worlds that exist in the city. In the present paradigm, this is what happens, that even institutions get co-opted within gated communities. And this is where I think architecture and urban design begins to create very hard thresholds between different parts of society. It creates very hard lines in the process of how it can be organized. And again, I think this becomes a huge challenge because then you have this detachment in terms of how gated communities are, whether they're vertical or whether they're on the edge of the city. There's a form of succession from the city because these communities don't even rely on physical infrastructure from the city or the municipality. They have their own wells, their own sanitation, and it's a form of succession. So it's a huge political question that we even encourage uh, development like this within the planning paradigm. And again, the role of the state then becomes a very important question as we're talking about how we even imagine planning. Mm -hmm. And so this explosion is what I'm sort of talking about. When I look at Latin America, those become the images that one thinks about. And I think it, uh, that's not true for all of Latin America. 
maybe it was Rio at some point, which now they're trying to correct. But this happens because the favela is a site for just residential use. It is not a site of production. Of course, it produces an economy in drugs, it produces the lumpen youth, and because of the lumpen youth, you begin to start getting this kind of polarization that occurs. In India, for example, the slums are centers of production. They are the places where the most production happens. So in fact, they are the safest places in the city. They are often the most social places in the city. They are most often the most vibrant places in the city. And they really become the engines. They also become the sites which connect our city to the global network of economy and production uh, in terms of export. But you get a very funny kind of urban form. And I am showing you all of this because this was my dilemma having studied like many of my colleagues here at the MAUD program at Harvard and gone back to India. I mean, I was like, what is urban design? I mean, how does one imagine it? Because I left the US at a point where private enterprise had completely taken over city planning. The state had no role to play. And so what did urban design mean? I mean, how do you even intervene in this kind of tapestry, which is very rich at one level, we can fetishize it, but what does it mean in terms of intervention? And so. For me, the way of uh, constructing a narrative over the years that I worked there, between the formal, informal, dissolving the binary, I started using the word the kinetic city. Uh, and I felt it was a productive term which I extracted from a very extreme condition in Mumbai, but it had a, a, a relevance, I believe, a resonance, uh, which we could look at uh, other cities, because it's more a condition, it's not a design tool, but it's a condition. I mean, what Louise was showing us was already beginning through technology to read that urban condition in the same way. So what it feels are now used for weddings uh, because public space becomes. So here, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that the kinetic city uh, is not just an extension of the informal. It's not a city of the poor. It's a particular condition in the way we use urbanism, which now through technology and other things we're reading more clearly. And corporations, uh, many other disciplines have understood this. Planning and urban design has lagged behind very much because we're using old paradigms to understand. So a friend of mine said it was very interesting that all the theory resides in the West and all the action resides in the East. So the empirical data from the East is fueling the theories of the West. Uh, and it's a very bizarre situation where we should be creating new theories in the East and using that empirical data to fuel those theories rather than the other way around. And in many disciplines, they're doing this in economics and things. And in planning, we haven't found the tools to do that yet. So let's look at this wedding, for example. You know, yesterday I said jokingly, this is a beautiful game of cricket. Uh, we call it an Indian game that the British invented, uh, but it's very popular in India, and this is the pitch where it's used. The cricketers, the school children, they finish playing, that's a club, and there are many Maidans like this. Uh, at 12 o'clock, when it's too hot to play cricket, these people come in with the bamboo and the rope, uh, and they start constructing the scene for a wedding, which very rich people use. Uh, here's all the props and the decoration, the flowers go up, and then by 8 o'clock, they're ready to receive the bride, uh, and they're all waiting. Uh, then the, the wedding happens, there are waterfalls, there are plants, there's video cameras, that's the bride and groom, and the wedding happens in the evening. Uh, it's wrapped around, and nobody touches the cricket pitch because that's sacred. There's a kitchen that is temporary there. The club members also use the kitchen, the wedding also uses the kitchen, and by the morning it disappears and they go back to cricket. So this is similarly for festivals. An entire street gets used for these beautiful festivals. Uh, and this is a human pyramid that gets built because this is a mosque where, because the mosque is too small, the population is too big, instead of expanding the mosque, they use the street for prayer and the street goes back to normalcy after the prayer is over. And so if you make a diagram of it, it's this sort of sense of incrementalism. So these are called the five stages of squatting. This guy is in the third stage of squatting. Uh, he has built a constituency around him. People come <coughs> slowly over a year, they become part of the landscape. The whole city grows with these incremental moves. They're not large gestures. Uh, and then you can begin to find equivalent types. So we've done a whole mapping exercise to understand this. I'm sorry, you guys can't even see, why don't you? I'm looking at them and I'm saying, how are they seeing the streets? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, and then, so we again were mapping how the city is really used for transaction through this kind of temporal landscape. And it's really ingenious because this guy is only using the fence, he's got a suitcase with shoes, he has a whole shoe shop there, uh, and he moves around. Louis, it'll be great in your technology to capture how these guys in transaction also move around because the markets are also shifting. Uh, and there are all sorts of barbers, flowers. Uh, now, this is an interesting image for me because 
this is creating a particular kind of visual culture. But what you see here are these sashes. And this is something Procter Gamble invented. Now, this talk about corporations responding to incrementalism. So there's a wonderful book which Lana should read. It's called The Bottom of the Pyramid. It's written by someone called uh, C.K. Pralat, who was at the University of Michigan. He was a professor there, an Indian professor there. He died a few years ago. But he wrote this book called The Bottom of the Pyramid, where he said that the biggest markets in the world are at the bottom of the pyramid, not on the top of the pyramid. And it was a matter of marketing. So what Procter Gamble did was like a bottle of shampoo, which a laborer working on a construction site in India can never afford because it's a full month salary. But by making the shampoo in small little packets where they just like we have in hotels for shaving and all of that, where you just use it the evening that you need it, then you only spend a few cents and your whole month's income doesn't get locked up in a bottle of shampoo because that's not a priority. But because it's these, these sachets and they do a lot of products like that from tobacco to shampoo to shaving cream, and in the process, they opened up a big market of millions of people because suddenly, so many more people could afford the products. And therefore, the market was very big. So this is recognizing incrementalism as a mode and then intervening it in, in terms of the cooperation. But in planning, we don't quite know how we act in that kind of condition. McDonald's, they're a driving idea, right? In Mumbai, McDonald's does home delivery. Because real estate is so expensive, you can't have a drive-in McDonald's, and that's not even part of the culture. So they do actually a home delivery. You can phone McDonald's, and they come in a scooter, and they give you your hamburger. Uh, but there's also not a hamburger, because no one eats beef. So it's vegetable <laughs> burgers. So they've also changed the product. And they're making millions in India, because they managed to adapt to understand how to intervene in that market. I mean, I'm only putting this there, because what does it mean for planning and urban design? Why? Do our narratives not even address these questions? We are just taking theory. So we are talking about new urbanism in Mumbai. We are just taking that theory and saying, will it work? Maybe it won't. So I mean, I think the narratives have to be different. And there's a whole logic here. Because the way this squatting is organized is linked to the index of security. This guy is the least secure. This guy is the most secure because he's bribed his way into the system. And so there's a whole blurring again of the formal and the informal economy. These are the statistics of bribes per day, uh, talking about corruption. So you can't separate the formal and the informal, because even in terms of economy, they're linked. The traffic police, the municipal officers, that's the bribes they get from people who are in the bazaar like that. So their lives are dependent on the informal economy, and they're part of the formal sector. So you can't make a break, even in economic terms, between the formal and informal any longer, which means we can't extend that into our discussions about urban form. You know, I always quote Mark uh, uh, Angeli from the ETH. He told me a wonderful story. He said he took students from ETH to Ethiopia, and they wanted to study informal settlements. So they reached Ethiopia in a bus. They had, they went around Adida bus, uh, the main city. They found an informal settlement they wanted to study. They spent three days. They made measure drawings. They took photographs. On the fifth and sixth day, they had kept to do interviews with the people in the informal settlement. And to their shock on the fifth day, they discovered it wasn't an informal settlement, it was a government settlement. It only looked like an yeah. informal settlement. <laughs> and so this idea of the aesthetic of informality, for example, I mean, I'm only proving the point of the non-productiveness in terms of design of what the formal and informal mean today. In our world today, it has completely blurred. And so the formal and informal economy depend on each other, uh, etc. So I mean, I think we just need to challenge these categories is, is, is the point I'm trying to make. So the idea of blurring these binaries. The characteristics of what I'm calling the kinetic city, it has a sense of elasticity. It grows with a strategy of incrementalism. It is about appropriation of space on a temporal scale, only for short time, so it doesn't alter the equations, and it's about the softening of thresholds in social terms. Architecture is not even the spectacle of these cities, and I mean, I think for me, yes, one has images of Rio, but the carnival is the image of Rio. Uh, similarly, in Mumbai, the great god uh, Ganesh, the immersion of the god is uh, the spectacle. Architecture is not the spectacle. This is what I, I was calling yesterday the landscape of impatient capital. Because this is just impatient capital that arrives and wants to be built. And I have noticed that you've also been bullied a little bit by impatient capital <laughs> in Santiago. Uh, and, and you know, so this elasticity is, so here community halls are made for 10 days. 
to have this festival and then it disappears and the street is back to normal. On the last day, there's these immersions. These are the big idols. It's a spectacular event with about five, six million people participating. That is the memory of the city. That's what people remember the city by. And this goddess is immersed and that becomes the new spectacle of the city. So to give you one more example, <coughs> talk about infrastructure. This is something which is very particular to uh, Mumbai. And I'm saying this hesitatingly, which is not a way of legitimizing it, but the Harvard Business School also wrote a case study on this uh, some years ago. So they obviously recognize it as a fruitful uh, uh, business. Uh, although, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, whether that is a good legitimacy because they say that uh, HBS without the H is only BS, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so here, yeah. this is a case where uh, Mumbai has a fantastic train system which goes uh, north-south uh, and because it's a long narrow island, uh, nowhere is too far from the train so people can actually walk in terms of networks and things like that. Now, it's about, I, I heard here it was four or five million people ride your subway which is absolutely incredible because about six or seven million people use uh, Mumbai's railway system which means the whole population of Sydney goes through Mumbai's railway every day. Even here, it's just amazing that your numbers are so big. So it's very popular, it's very efficient. Now, we have a fantastic service in, in, in Mumbai, which is called the Dabbawala, which is a man who delivers your lunch to you every day. Uh, it's very cheap, it's about, uh, it's about two, one, do one US dollar a month, or two US dollars a month maybe now, where what they do is they come to your house wherever you live, uh, and they pick up your lunch, which is in a box like this, uh, and they deliver it to your office and at 1 o'clock, and at 1.30 they come and pick it up and they take the box back to your house. And there, the studies, even the HBS studies have shown the error rate they have, the mistakes is one in a million boxes. That is roughly the error. There's a movie made on them. I mean, it's a very well-known thing among inform people who study informal economy. Now, there's also sociological reasons which are interesting. So there are two things that happen here. One is you have an efficient train system. The second is a cultural thing. So Indians love their food. Indians love their food hot. Indians have a lot of taboo in terms of religion, of what they can eat, and some people can't eat onions, etc. Some people can't eat meat, etc. And so for many, and the trains are very crowded, so you don't, can't carry your lunch, all that elaborate lunch. And also, a lot of Indians live in extended families, so there's always someone who might make the lunch for you after you leave, a grandmother who lives in the house, you know, extended families have that kind of support. So what these guys do, there are 3,000 of them from one community, and they organize this system by using the train system. Uh, it also does some interesting things. There are anthropologists who have studied it. Uh, Susan Katzenstein is an anthropologist who studied this, and she had many uh, interesting observations, but one of them was, very interesting that in a lot of our societies in urban areas, we now go to a place of work, we all wear similar kinds of clothes, so our ethnic identities are removed. But then when we sit around the table and have lunch when these people deliver it, suddenly your ethnic identity gets reinforced because you see each other's food. and So there are lots of, sort of interesting impacts, so it's a phenomenon. Now, what is interesting, and I'm going to just show you some slides quickly, is this is an informal economy that uses a formal piece of infrastructure, the railway system, and leverages it beyond its margins in an elastic way. So uh, for me, this is a very important example of what I'm saying, where the formal and the informal collapse and they blur. These are the kinds of examples I think we have to look at for our own inspirations, because this is a complete synthesis of the formal and the informal into the third space, into this kind of kinetic space. So here, they pick it up, the grandmother has given them the lunch, they have uh, relays, so they pick up the boxes, they come to the trains, they load it, they have a compartment they occupy, they reach the downtown, they begin to start distributing it, they break down again into small groups. This is the guy in the elevator, he's arranging it. This is the code, it tells you which zone it is, which building, which floor, that it's a very simple code but it has no error. And then at 1.30 he gives you your lunch, you can make your calls. <laughs> and then he picks it up and he takes it away. Uh, so this sort of the combination is, I think, very interesting. And the city is also like that. It's not really differentiated in space. It's pixelated uh, as, and you know, like in a television screen, the smaller the pixels, the greater the resolution. So in these cities also, the smaller these pixels, the greater the social resolution. So they, the segregation question 
uh, and the integration question I think becomes really interesting of how one can study it. Of course, housing is a big problem. India has the greatest overcrowding of homes, it's the worst situation in terms of housing. Uh, it's deplorable. I mean, when I see what I'm shown here as low cost or low income housing, they look luxurious compared to what they have in India. No one invests in the house because of the lack of tenure of the land. People invest in many other things but not in the house because they have no security over the house and demolition is very disruptive. This is a before and after image of that slum and it just leaves that memory and it comes back and it's demolished. This is an image I took from my studio. It's right behind my old studio. This was a whole settlement that was there. One day I woke up and I looked out and I saw that they had started removing the settlement. Within three months they had stitched the whole uh, hill and they were going to build now new condominiums. So this is again global capital and how it's creating these incredible disruptions in our city especially when the state is not getting involved anymore in planning. The state subject, I mean, that's a really critical question. It's not to sound left or right, but I mean, the state planning is the state. And I think if you're talking about pedagogy, unless we interrogate that question, I think we will be teaching the wrong things. Because then you have questions of inequity. That's the world's largest house, smallest form of development happening together. This problem is going to keep persisting. Yesterday I was talking about, if you look, you showed John Turner and things. But the literature on uh, low-cost housing, informal housing, goes through these phases of denial when nation states were being formed, eradication when nation states had new ideas and visions, tolerance when democracies were formed, improvement when everyone accepted that these settlements would stay in place and they can't be removed, and we have to anticipate. And we have to anticipate at the macro level, and this is a scheme that a few architects, including Charles Correa, did in Mumbai, where they created a whole new metropolitan area of New Mumbai. Uh, and they began to look at the metropolitan region, how transportation can be used as an indirect subsidy on housing, and again, the state's role becomes important. And that's what, what planning is about, orchestrating these things, but how do you also look at natural systems and those relationships when we talk about landscape and its relationship to urbanism. I mean, I think now as a species, we are much more sensitized to the role of mangroves for climate change, etc. How does that get integrated into the sensibilities of a city? How infrastructure can be orchestrated uh, to create new metropolitan imaginations? Uh, and you know, systems of parks. One of my students did this using the train system and creating a metropolitan park as a way of creating the identity of the region. In, in Mumbai, we have a draconic system where for slums, what we do is now we give it to a developer, the whole favela, and what the developer does is takes half the favela and puts it in a transfer camp, and then builds housing for the rich people on that half, and that money that is used for them to house the poor people. So you have the richest people then living next to the poorest people in this paradigm. Now this model depends on very high real estate value. And the moment the markets collapse, the whole system collapses because then the rich get their house and the poor keep staying in a transfer camp on the edge of the city. And so this is creating a lot of social tension in the city. And so I was very happy to see some of the housing projects here and the way the state is involved uh, and Elementa and others in trying to solve this problem. And so this is just an interesting example. I wish I could show it to the Elementa people because this is, uh, I think, resonates. But the government decided uh, to involve some architects in housing. So what the government did was they did their regular housing. Uh, and then they got Charles Correa to do a housing, which he did here using the intelligence of the favela. And it was interesting that the government called their housing, which is the government housing, mass housing, because they felt they're housing the mass. And they did not know how to deal with Charles Courier's housing, so they called it the artist village. <laughs> you know, it was crazy that people would live like that. So it's a very interesting perception of what uh, people imagine. So I'll just show you. What he did was interesting. He said, how do we actually look at the whole spectrum of people? That means that yesterday, talking, you know, when we were going around, what I learned was that for housing, if you can make the perception that it is a middle class housing, not a low cost, how you solve the problem, although the house is very small because then there's an aspirational dimension, which is exactly what he tried to do. And he also said that we will not do the rogue, grow housing kind of thing, which I saw a little bit of yesterday, we were talking about it, and that's why I think this is interesting. This is what the government does, this is mass housing. So it's nine meters apart, seven stories high, there's, it's 400 square feet, 40 square meters. It's really pathetic, it's like ghettos. It will be like what American social housing was and we'll be demolishing it soon. It's, there's no reason we should be doing it. So what he did as a reaction was, 
He created a cluster system so that you would have a sense of community. And the efficiency was only 2% different in terms of land use. So it was very efficient uh, in that kind of thing. And what he came up with, and even in the service areas, although the length of pipes was a little longer, which is why you do row housing, it was only a 2% difference. And all he did was a system where these walls were made to be blank walls. And then you could do anything within your plots. The flexibility was you didn't get caught down into a row housing kind of scheme. And then they did a, a model cluster to show how the smallest house can grow into the biggest house for a middle class person so that it would work for that. And essentially the cluster system got stacked so that you had communities of seven, eight people who could live together. And this is what I saw here with the streets with you know 14 people maybe. And this sort of aggregated so that you got a sub-community. And then that sub-community repeated so that you got another community which was, you know, at a, so this is really a question of creating a hierarchy of space. Uh, and through that hierarchy, you began to build a site plan that spread out and was responding to the natural elements and the topography and all of that. And they built a model which was in very cheap materials just to demonstrate what the common wall means and how people uh, could live there. Uh, and that is the cluster house that they built. And it was very cheap material, so I went back. Those images I took when I went as a student in 86, when I was at the GSD, and now I've been going back with my students, and one of the two houses that were not occupied, they just basically dissolved. Because what they did was they, they, it was the land they were giving people with the DNA of how it could be organized. They just made a few sample houses. And then this is an image, and you should just notice this, these buildings, because I, this was an image I took in 86, and I went back there three years ago, and that same picture now looks like that. So the whole place has actually completely transformed. When we are talking about what we saw in the element and the balconies, but here it's fundamentally transformed as over 20 years people have invested uh, money in different ways and buildings are actually, but the DNA is the same, which means the blank walls are the same, the hierarchy of courtyards is the same, the sense of community of course changes, but it gets maintained. Uh, craftsmanship, which I was noticing yesterday because it creates employment, people have improved, some people have kept their clusters like that because they've been maybe one joint family, and this is the difference. That housing evolved in this organic pattern. It, all, it has the intelligence and the incrementalism, the aesthetic of incrementalism, which the favelas have. And I think that's something we have to deconstruct and build a narrative for. And the mass housing has stayed as mass housing, and it hasn't changed. And it's interesting to see those differences. I think all these lessons and these readings will be important for us in India there, because those narratives will be used. These are cities where they don't even have a planner. They don't have any technical capacity. And they will need completely different narratives for anything to happen. But it's also the place we should be intervening because it's less contested and those services are really needed. And I just want to, from that, go into the project of the Economy <coughs> City, which was, this is now leading to more pedagogy, but this is a project Felipe was involved in, we did recently, and we call it mapping the ephemeral megacity. Because we asked the question that if you have interdisciplinary work, which is a fundamental question that we're asking in the pedagogy of urban design, landscape, landscape urbanism, the planning, how do you make interdisciplinary work uh, work, work? And we felt that if we took uh, out of the box problem, which nobody had any idea about, maybe it could work. So this was a project, this is a festival that happens in India every 12 years. It's a religious festival, it's the world's biggest Hindu congress, but it's also the biggest gathering of human beings on the planet uh, that ever happens. Uh, it happens every 12 years. And so we call the project Mapping the Ephemeral Megacity, because seven million people live here for 55 days and 20 million people visit every five days. So about 100 million people actually come here in the period of 55 days. That is as big a management problem as you can actually imagine. And so this project became an interdisciplinary project like the Rockefeller, the South Asia Institute became the umbrella. And we had the School of Business, School of Public Health, Graduate School of Design, School of Religion, Divinity, and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences all participating with their faculty and their students. And 40 of us actually went and lived in this festival for eight days uh, to observe it on the ground. And that is what it looked like when I went in July uh, with Felipe was with me. Uh, this is the site of the festival. Uh, that's where the two rivers meet and that's why it's a holy point. That is a memory of the road from 12 years before when they built the city. 
And when we back, went back to the same spot in January, when we went to live there, that's what we saw. The whole city had been built in six weeks. They build the whole city, they deploy the whole city for, for seven million people to live there. The government does this, it's completely run by the government. Their temples, their community halls, their tents for people to live in, their hospitals. Uh, that is what it was before. That's what it looks like. It, after the river recedes, when the sand becomes visible, they make the city on that. So they only know in October after the monsoon what the site will be. So it's a virtual site on which the city sits very softly and in 55 days the city disappears and the river comes back and takes the site away. So it's very poetic in that way of settlement uh, and occupation. And these are some before and after. We used a kite to map it because we couldn't get permission to do aerial photography. But these are all before and after images. That's what it begins to look like in the first few days. There are streets that are made. That's what the landscape on the ground looks like. Um, it's all holy men and gurus. They use the town planning scheme. Then when Chandigarh was done, they started using the sector system. This has been happening for 5,000 years. So, but it's never been studied as a city before. And it needed this kind of interdisciplinary uh, study. Uh, it also is on a grid, and every road on the grid goes across on a bridge, which is what you saw there. These are the bridges which are deployed for the use of the city. Those are some of the statistics that you have. Uh, 163 kilometers of road are made just for the city uh, to occur. They, they, you know, it's, it's, it's like a full city that is simulated just for 55 days. And our interest is seeing how we could learn from it, not only in terms of planning deployment for our small towns, but also how we might look at refugee camps, how we might look at emergency housing, how we might look at other ways that uh, uh, cities can be deployed uh, very quickly. And then this is you know, the, the bathing, the prayers, uh, and you know, 20 million people line up from 3 in the morning for the whole day to do this, then it gets demolished after 55 days, and then the river comes and washes it clean and leaves no memory at all. So this is a project we are yet working on, but it's giving us a lot of, and I'm happy at the round table to talk about these experiences, because it has challenged the superficiality as well as the depth, potential depth of interdisciplinary work. Uh, I think often interdisciplinary work just becomes a token. Just because we have four people from different disciplines sitting around a ta table doesn't make it interdisciplinary work. How do you really transgress each other's disciplines? And we learned a lot from that perspective uh, on doing this project, which I'd be happy uh, to talk about. And that's what is left after the monsoon comes and leaves really uh, no memory. I'm just going to end with this envoy to go back to India. The small towns is where our future is going to lie. It's a different kind of landscape from what we imagine. Uh, politicians want India to be 85% urban. It's not going to happen. Uh, that is, we're going to be about, by 2030, we will be about 40% urban. Uh, we go, but we are going to, in the next uh, 10 years, we're going to add 250 million people to our city. So can you imagine the capacity we are going to need in a place like India? And this is where I think dialogues with Latin America becomes very important because I think these are going to be the sites of action. This is going to be the site from where future theory should emerge, not just be used for empirical data, because these numbers are very dramatic. So all Western theory tests itself against this number. And China, because of its political condition, took that, and they have just replicated those models in terms of making those cities in the same way. I think Latin America, South Asia, Africa are yet non-committed societies. And we have the option of looking at other paradigms because our own democracies slow us down in a positive, sometimes negative way. But I think for thinking this through, it's very important. This new infrastructure is going to be important. It's going to mean displacement. So there are going to be a lot of social issues. Uh, the uh, Pearl River Delta area has already experienced some of this. I won't go into this. But those are the kinds of projections uh, that we're going to have. We're going to have 68 cities with over 1 million people compared to 42 today. Uh, which will be very interesting. And it's the small towns that are really going to grow. And that's going to be more or less the pattern where the urbanization is spread. We're going to have mega corridors, I think, which will be very important. Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Delhi, they're already looking at this project. AECOM, which is an international firm, has been appointed to do it. I don't know what that means. But I think the challenge in developing these narratives, I'll just finish in a minute, uh, is, is, is something that I think you might share here in Latin America is that the way we divide our cities is 
through the Census Commission of India. So if it's over 10 million people, it's a mega city, metro area, cities, town. Or we look at the Indian government house rent allowance, because the government has a rent allowance, so that defines how the city should be. Now, all of these definitions are really based on city size. So we say if it's over 50,000, it should be this kind of city. That is actually quite ridiculous in today's world, mm -hmm. listening to Louis, listening to what technology can do, listening to new imaginations that might happen. So I think one fundamental thing to build new narratives that we have to do as a community is to develop new taxonomies. Because our taxonomies are wrong if you're looking at only number, because culture doesn't get factored in, aspirations don't get. So what might be the new city types? We were thinking in India, information technology towns, energy towns, heritage towns, religious towns, because in India, a religious town, a temple town, usually has 100,000 people, but when the festivals happen four times a year, it becomes 10 million people. Now the planning imagination there should be different. The temple trust is never a partner in the governance. So the government comes from outside, they make a bus station 10 kilometers away, then you have cars, it's complete madness. So how can you imagine elasticity for four days in the year, you're planning infrastructure for the whole year, which is crazy. So I think the whole imagination will be different if we relook at what the taxonomies could possibly be. And I think that would be really the future for these places, for these mega regions. And I think this is something, at least in my study, is valid for South Asia, because that culture I know. And I'd be curious to know what it might mean uh, for Latin America. So with that, I'm going to put on the table five points, which I hope might structure some of our, our discussions. The first one is that um, I'm just picking up on Louise's sort of uh, 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 presentation. And for me, what was important about that was the notion, and I spoke a little bit about it yesterday from another perspective, is the instruments for advocacy. That if planning and urban design is about advocacy, what are the new instruments for advocacy? How do we see these new patterns? I mean, we, we are trained to see patterns of density and figure ground and land use and population. Now the kinds of intersections we can create with these new data sets uh, and their shifting quality is a different instrument. And so how do we read patterns from, so the ter terra firma kind of idea but looking at social and cultural landscapes. Why do I think advocacy is important? Because I'll just give you my own uh, experiences. I, I studied the GSD, some of you did the MAUD, and I went back, and that's why I showed this before making these comments, I went back into this condition. And I was very confused, what does urban design mean? And then in reflecting about it, and more recently, I realized that what I had learned at the GSD in terms of urban design was, was that it was inherently about advocacy, meaning that planning had become very abstract. It had become blobs of color on a land use plan. It had become very two-dimensional. It had become policy. Architecture had become very site-specific. It had become autonomous. The architects didn't want to even see what was on either side because they were worried about the object. And urban design as a practice was created as a bridge discipline, which means that urban designers were architects who were trained to understand the policy implications and the three-dimensional implication of policy on the environment, and therefore basically understand what architects were thinking, but be able to speak to the planners so that you could create this feedback loop. Now, inherently, anything that is about creating a feedback loop is about advocacy, because it is about closing a loop. So it means it's a different role. Nobody knocks on your door to invite you as an urban designer, except when private enterprise is developing big chunks of the city, which is what happened to America, which happened in many parts of Europe also. I think Spain went through this in, in part. So those became big forms of architecture. But inherently, urban design, at least in our context, I think has to be much more about advocacy. And that's why I think the instruments we develop for that advocacy becomes important. And that's the first question I'd like to put up for debate. And that's also linked, uh, and maybe Fernando, you might have something to say to this, is this division always, that I'm always corrected by my professors, some of your contemporaries who say, no, urban design is not even a discipline, it's a practice. Uh, and, our, and, and urban planning is the discipline, because urban design, it doesn't have enough of a theoretical base, it hasn't reflected on what it's doing, and its clarity about its role is undefined. So, I mean, I think it's an open, I mean, we can have differences, but I just want to put that on the table uh, for discussion. Uh, the second thing is, um, the, uh, what is the difference then, I mean, how does one bring urban planning and urban design closer together in our contemporary scenario? Uh, and at least at the GSD, what we've been doing is, we've been trying to differentiate between urban studies and urban planning. Urban studies 
tends not to often be committal because it's about studying urbanism and its different forms. Urban planning, the moment you make a plan, there's a commitment. How you uh, assess the impact of the plan becomes another debate that we can open up and what it means. But I think urban planning implies uh, commitment, it implies uh, speculation, it implies looking at spatial possibility and their impact. Uh, so what is that difference between urban studies and urban planning, or do we see a difference? What is that new formulation? I think it's, um, it's an interesting question. Uh, the, th the next one is, I think the geographies and the nodes of engagement uh, as a pedagogical question for us, at least at the GSD, and the way I've been imagining our program is I imagine two matrices, and I imagine a matrix of geographies, so Latin America, South Asia, China, Europe, North America, etc. And then on the other axis, I imagine modes of engagement. So advocacy, state-run projects, uh, private-run projects, etc., etc. Because, for example, when I take students to India uh, and we look at the urban condition, the state has no real role, the private enterprise hasn't really kicked in, civil society is very active, the NGO sector, etc. So I can expose them to that mode of planning, of intervening, of patronage, etc. It's transitionary, I'm not saying it's a solution, but from that extreme condition, they learn about a particular mode of engagement. And these are American students, Indian students. African students and all of that. When I look at uh, urban planning projects in America, it's always the private sector. If you look at China, it's the state and the hierarchy of the state. So these become geographies where particular models of engagement, not to say one is better than the other, but they are different models of engagement and we don't know which model will play itself out in which political geography at what time, because all our conditions change. But I think that exposure to different modes of engagement becomes an important thing across different geographies as we are thinking about curriculum uh, and, uh, and formulation. So I want to just put that uh, on the table. And, and as, as a result of that, there's also different kinds of obsessions uh, within the North and the South. So in the North, uh, the problems are there's too much capacity, meaning there are more planners that they can employ, and it's largely got to do with revitalization. It's, Detroit is one example of an extreme. Uh, you know, I always say, I used to do a year, for four years, I did a fall semester studio in Mumbai and a spring semester studio in Detroit, which were like two extremes. And I finally concluded in four years that you can solve the, the problems of both cities if you just took four million people from Mumbai to Detroit. <laughs> so, you know, so, so here, it, it, in the North American condition, it's all revitalization and how do we create more jobs and how do we create smarter and creative class and this, that and the other. In the South, it's about managing growth. I mean, how do you get ahead of the growth? How do you speculate about that? It's a completely, and there's no capacity because we're very few planners. So they're reversal of problems. So I think that's very, very interesting. The middle class was brought up, and I think it's a very interesting question in Latin America and South Asia, with the middle class growing so quickly. The middle class, the politicians sell Shanghai and Dubai to the middle class, but what they're selling to the middle class is predictability, reliance on the state, we deliver the basic communities, because the middle class have to depend on the state for education, health, transportation. So then those metaphors get used as narratives get built for the wrong reasons in democracies, etc. So then how you recognize the middle class, etc. I mean, this has huge implications, I believe, on planning. The next one is just the idea of the speculative edge of planning. Should it have a speculative edge? I can't tell you, I was telling my colleagues here, how I've sat through painful presentations in America where people have done very elaborate PhDs on uh, uh, car ridership by single um, African-American women in the suburbs of Detroit using data from 1980 to 1995. And I think, my God, even the iPhone didn't exist and the world has changed so much. Why are we even listening to this, you know, for, for example? So I think how can actually planning get its speculative edge back and urban design get its speculative edge back rather than its rear guard action? kind of approach, I think is a very important question. And the last question I just put on the table, which I had already done earlier, which is, what does patronage mean for planning and for urban design? And what is the responsibility of the state? Uh, what can be our formulations that might even re-engage the state in the process of planning? Because I mean, I think that responsibility of blowing the whistle of the state absolving itself of some of the responsibilities is also part of the profession's, I think, responsibilities, because I think we are best equipped to articulate uh, the problems that uh, occur around the state being so passive 
in its engagement uh, with planning. And that's linked to the question of patronage, which is then linked to the question of models of engagement, which then has a direct link on pedagogy and the way we imagine education. Thank you very much.
is how do you facilitate the adjacencies between these disparate worlds and urban forms? Uh, we, we, we use freeways and that image was wonderful, which showed natural boundaries between segregation. But <coughs> what are the natural ways we can actually fuse these? What are those edge conditions? That's actually an amazing urban design task where the disparity of form can be resolved through other forms of whether it's neutralizing elements like infrastructure, uh, or public space, or you know other things which um, allow very disparate forms to coexist, uh, which has not been part of our imagination because we uh, always strive to see coherence in urban form uh, in a way that uh, it's singular, it's almost dogmatic uh, because we, we see this or that. So the simultaneous validity of differences is going to be, it's a very hard design challenge, uh, but it's a fundamental one and it's exactly what you've articulated. I just wanted to formulate that in a different way. Thank you very much. More of a comment, I have a question. Uh, what we saw in like the three of your presentation was in a way uh, like new problems or new issues that we are like all facing and that and, and uh, since we have this kind of a sub-narrative uh, on this conversation that uh, we are trying to uh, discuss how do we uh, think of the pedagogy of planning and urban design like in the years to come. Uh, uh, so dealing with this question, with our all like issues but, um, but it seems that uh, the traditional modes of operation in the city, meaning like architecture, urban design, and planning, are not giving perhaps the right solutions today. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, like the three of you, like after your presentation, how do you envision uh, different uh, modes of practice? What would be, when we were actually talking the other day with you, so what would be the, the realms or, 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 the, or the domains of operation of an urban practitioner? Or what is the, like, the evolution of the urban like, architect, uh, urban design? Uh, Well, if, if I can try to jump, <laughs> the bravest of us over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll try to link that to what Fernando was talking about material and then material in a certain way. And um, what I might give in my opinion now is a very personal opinion. And I think it, it, it transgrades, I, I mean, it goes to all what you described as urban design, urban planner, and um, and we were talking like, go to my notes, uh, architects, urban planners, planning, you know, uh, urban design, landscape, urban projects, and so on. Um, and how that, how we have formative uh, discipline, disciplines in the academy, which are very much linked to the, to the practice, to the professional practice in public or private uh, practice, but in a certain way as, uh, as a chain of production, you know, it's, it's where you can look for a job, which is different where you can apply your capacities, I think. And I think that there's a, a slight difference in understanding academia in those two ways. Uh, a way in which you understand academia, not where your curr curriculum will fit better, but where your capacities were developed and performance better. And I think that that's a crucial, uh, it's, it's, it looks like a very small gap but for me, it's it's like a, it's it's a very deep and profound uh, difference. I wouldn't say separation, but difference. Uh, in that sense, I think if if I go back to architects as I was formed, uh, architects actually do they, they decide complex decision in three dimensional ways. You know, if I'm an architect of this room, I have to do a, a series of decisions about lighting, about opening, about door, about floor height. Uh, <coughs> materiality and, and, and so on, and, and I put all those variables, which are very complex variables together, into a, a sequence of three-dimensional succession of events or performance of the building. Uh, we saw yesterday Raul's, you know, uh, vertical gardening building, and you have people living in the facade and people living in the medium room, uh, in those, and, and literally in that way. I think that that three-dimensional capacity of complex, of understanding complexity, is something that you can apply certainly as a job in a curriculum, but also it's a capacity. It's, it's also is a capacity that can perform itself in the most various ways. Uh, and and actually, um, the the challenge is to break up that track frontiers of the jobs. In my sense, in my opinion, and and look towards the other um, mm -hmm. aspects of that you can jump into the capacities. So, at the end, uh, a designer is a 
a person with a huge capacity of understanding complex variables in, in spatial terms. And, and that is immense. That, that world is just <coughs> huge, in which you can navigate, actually, advocacy through urban design, urban planning, um, and so on, in, and landscape, and uh, urban economy, even, and so on. And you can add up uh, engineering to that, as we were talking about infrastructures and, uh, and things to that. How that, that relates to materiality or immateriality? I think that uh, the, the predominance of the building, of the master planning, uh, of, of the aesthetic of something put together brick by brick, it has been so strong in our uh, academy, in, in the formation of our academy, uh, in a certain way that perhaps we believe too much that what we have to do has to be so tangible as a building. Or everything that we see is valid only if and if it is valid for a project or for a master plan or for a zoning plan or whatever. And I think there's a lot of uh, immateriality and I think I, I'm, maybe I'm understanding materiality in different terms as Fernando uh, was mentioned, but th there's a whole uh, level, multiple layers of immateriality that are uh, behaving in this world that sometimes they collapse into a project, into a design, and sometimes not, and sometimes they influence. And I think, uh, just to understand that, that very small gap, that very small trench between uh, thinking about curriculum, thinking about academic programs in terms of the job career, or in terms of performance of capacities, uh, you know, it, it delivers like in, in, in two different tracks. As if, if you took one train or the other train, it comes from the two, same train station, but it takes you like to very different places. I just want to add to what Lucia said, is that the question comes a moment where we're living a paradox on, on, on the profession and, and the teaching of urban planning and design. Why? Because particularly in the global south, we have never experienced such a huge demand for solving all these emerging uh, questions uh, related to uh, access to housing, services, transportation, uh, public goods and so on. I mean, uh, it, it's just here in Chile, uh, uh, we, we never had this, this climax before of discussions about uh, the urban realm, uh, the public spaces, transportation, uh, and, and, and something that, that is symptomatic of, of a need. So, so, so and, and, and it's something that is quite common in, in the global south and emerging uh, 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 cities, as, 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 as Rahul said. In the north, they have already solved everything, and, and they're much more interested in spectacle and restoration or, or, or recovery or, or land remediation, rather than really uh, coping with, with emerging needs. The problem of this paradox is that it, it, it finds us probably on one of, on, on one of the most confused and, I would say, uh, uh, Weak moment on the profession when 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 architecture uh, at some point was kind of like uh, distracted by by aesthetic discourses, star architecture, single building magazine published uh, uh, ideal of of, of 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 the profession, and not really uh, looking towards this huge land of opportunities on all these emerging areas. And, um, and I think that the way we're responding, and, and it's something that you can feel it, uh, like here with the Design Lab project, uh, what we're trying to do with our undergrad architecture program at UED, and what's happening everywhere, is that we're trying to uh, redefine, uh, not the scope, because the scope is going to be limited, uh, but the capacities of urban planners and designers as articulators, as advocates, and I think that we're missing is the power. If we don't find ways to have access to sources of power, we'll not be able to do it. And I don't know, and I'm not clear, because I've been kind of like during my short career trying to uh, engage with the political power, economic power, economic power, and I failed in everywhere. Um, <laughs> and, and, and where, 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 or how and can we? And, and pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you love when I say that. Uh, but 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 we must 
find a way uh, to, 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 to fill those gaps, to articulate those bridges, as Rahul said. And the only way to really gain power again, uh, or, or at least acceptance and relevance from decision makers, um, is through engagement at different levels. And, and, and that could be at the community level, that could be at the social level, at the political, and so on. And, 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 and cross-disciplinary approaches and articulations are going to be the key. So I think that uh, in the future I see that uh, we, I hope we won't see more star urbanists and we're going to see much more uh, star processes. One of the good experiences I had last year, because really talking in academia, you know, what's happening in the real world, what, what Luis was talking about, I think there's a real crisis between what people want, what clients want, what we're teaching, you know, what we teach, and, and so architects come to the real world. As you were saying, you know, I came from the DSP, and like, now what? How do I use these tools? You know? So one of the very good experiences I had last year was um, the day in Catholic University had, had this agreement with uh, Stanford. Uh, and so I had the opportunity to go to Silicon Valley, which I thought was very interesting for our question, because what they I saw there integrated very well was um, innovation, research, and market. So they were sort of integrating, uh, let's call projects, you know, what we were taught to design them, with the state of things, what, what, what's the establishment, our cities, you know, and planning, with what businesses and what people want. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that relationship very, very fluid, and I think, you know, one of the things we are missing as architects, so at least I'm missing as is knowing a little bit more about how to do market research, understanding what clients want, and what is our value. Because for me, and, and I don't know why this doesn't work, architects, we should be like the rock stars of everything, because no one has us, you know, we know how to understand the difficulties of problems, you know, on a spatial scale, on desires of people, on a problematic scale, and integrate it in one design. <coughs> But we fail, I think, and that's why we don't have the power, we fail in understanding the market. I mean, money in a way is power, to realize things and do it. So that would be like one comment. And one of the largest failures or problems I've had in most of my professional career is related with uh, operations. You know, because cities and landscapes are alive. So as architects, I don't know, I was trying to be an architect, you know, you design a building, you want the light in here, you have everything orchestrated, and then it comes, and you take the picture, and you're famous. But architects and urban designers, we design everything, and it's done, and it's horrible. And you go two years after, and sometimes it's even more horrible. So how do you make that happen? You know, it's, it's an ongoing process, and the problem is, you're not hired anymore. So it's not your problem anymore. And for me, that has been a real problem, to, to actually make things happen. Uh, and thank you very much. I also think this integration is very, very You know, I noticed that when they demolished, when the city bought the houses to open the, the way for the metro cable and they demolished the houses, they kept some of the pools that belonged to the houses for public use. And they weren't under any control, so the people just organized and used them. And they told me, what, I, what I thought was, uh, that would be impossible here in Chile, because as Paolo and, and Luis mentioned, um, or I, what I analyzed from what they told us, is that we live in a very paradoxical situation where the state is quite behind the needs of the city, but in, in a different level, uh, it controls many things of our you know, public behavior, of our city behavior. And um, I think that what you said uh, about you know, dissolving this binary uh, point of view on the formal and informal is quite, uh, I mean, it's very useful for us in terms of I think recovering some traditions which are to a certain point forgotten. Now we are in the in a point which I would call a watershed in terms of culture context of uh, cultural uh, conception of the society, where people are demanding participation. And I think that history of advocacy planning and participatory design that uh, you can find in Latin America is quite interesting in terms of what would be the role of the architect. Uh, a facilitator, an advocate. Um, for instance, back in the late 50s in Chile, there was a housing demand which was 
so huge that the state couldn't cope with it. So people could start organizing and taking land. And some of the architects came afterwards, and they helped people to plan their informal settlements. So there was a, actually a mix of informal, the informal and informal. And I think that um, we can, you know, take back that uh, experiences to, you know, redefine our role. And I think uh, we have uh, plenty of examples that help us to, you know, I would say it again define what is really the role of architecture, urban design, planning uh, in the current situation. No, just the last two, uh, and I want to refer to your saying for, and you were sort of resonating too, is, and this might sound a bit cliche, but I think it's important that, you know, I mean, I think the only way to make humane environments is to have the human being at the center of our imagination. Somehow, in the abstraction of the way we deploy our own disciplines, uh, there's a detachment. And that's linked to his point about power and all of that. And I, again, I, I use this carefully, I don't have the right words, but you know, politicians have constituencies who vote for them. Uh, we don't, and I'm not saying we need to be like politicians, but we need to build constituencies. And we can only build constituencies if we have the human being at the center of our imagination. But that's a very broad conceptual thing. But more specifically, and I think that's why I like Fernando's reminding us about the culture, that every place has a planning culture. So you refer to Medellin, and that won't work in Chile. And you're absolutely right. And I think there have been a lot of organizations that have been promoting the notion of model practices and you know, model projects. That's highly problematic because it you we can't replicate these. There are some things we can replicate, but there are lots of things we can't. Because there are intersections in places which is about path planning culture, which makes Medellin was very particular, the mayor, good architects, they have a surplus on their funding. They could do things that made that possible, in democracies of other kinds. It doesn't happen. Now, what is the role of urban planning and design? This goes to Luis's point. Uh, you know, the only one thing that I've heard from the World Bank, which I've liked, uh, is, is they used to say in India in the 70s, which was very interesting, they used to say that they have a shelf of projects. <coughs> which means they, basically, the idea is that in our conditions, the political window of opportunity opens sometimes. Now, when it opens and there's a good mayor, all of us go running and we start making projects and ideas and things. But those windows open for such a short time that by the time our ideas are ready, the window closes. Then we get into despair, and then we get more and more discouraged, and we forget even making ideas. So there is a kind of cynicism that draws from it. So what they were saying was that we should have a shelf of ideas so that when the window opens, we can pop the idea and before the window closes. So what that means is that it's actually part of our responsibility, and this is where the academy can play a role. We do studios, we do things sometimes out of the fetish that a professor might have in their own uh, <coughs> ideas of research or whatever. But if we actually make the cities our labs in a real way, I mean, like we were saying with the technology, and we actually made propositions which were systematically organized that met both the contingencies of the city, but also pedagogical demands, uh, I think the role of activism and advocacy becomes automatic there. Because even the students who worked on those projects, if they're all on that shelf of ideas, 10 years, they have ideas they can go back to and become advocates for. So I think we have to be much more systematic in the way we play our role in society, which comes from again playing. Yeah. I think that uh, today, what development, development means, it's in question. Like, uh, to say that because now we eat more ice cream and coke, <coughs> we are uh, wealthy and happy, uh, it was a truth maybe 10 years ago, but now I'm not sure. I think that what right and wrong is changing, and we, we can manage to, to, to live with people that, that have different way of living, and, and, the, and you can give to the students the tools that, that pour this, this tool to what each kind of community in a different geography, if in, in 
the same country, the north, different than the south, uh, and don't think like the solution that works for one place is going to be the, the good for every, everywhere. So to change the way we teach from what was the, the, the what the magazine what, what publishes to, to how to fix and be a part of a system that actually needs that are different from which I also uh, wanted to share or talk or ask you about one of the things I found that's really interesting and uh, Luis was talking about it in YouTube was that urban planning and landscape, one of the difficulties about theory, academia, practice is that it's alive. And so that makes it continually on changing and changing with different users. So looking at the Transcendental conversation, I thought it was so beautiful because that has a time and a place, you know, and and that's just wonderful. So how can we architects integrate those tools, you know, to make people really be a part of, of the transformation? I think that's one of the real challenges of introducing technology into the urban design realm. Okay. It's about communication. So if planning is about communication, and the workshop should be about how we train people to listen, not just how we train to put around all the walls the lovely designs that each group would like to have, and then you compete and say which design they want things the best. And so, well, are those design people? So it comes back to relevance about how we. And so that's something we have to have. I mean, and then <coughs> those people who do the design, we don't design all people in, in a direct sense as you'll love, you'll love this. It's how we listen, and it's, so it's about sharing. It's about, and that's a big, that's, that's really difficult. Because I'm not sure if we have the, the right tools, the right methods in our programs to make that happen. I think that's, that's a tough thing we have to face to engage with. That's a, yeah. What Daniel's talking about, about participation. So they said, God gave us one mouth and two ears. <laughs> 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 Going back to your first <coughs> sorry, intervention about the proper questions, I think it's, it's a very central one. But at the same time, I need much these. It's linked with the issue of going back and forth. Because, <coughs> for instance, I think this is so complex because it is uh, the, the complex relationship between knowledge and action which is behind that. So, and, and sometimes we think we, we should go from knowledge to action, or sometimes, you know, from action to learn, but I think we need to go back and forth and connect, and this is something very, very difficult to do. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that would be in the center of our, of our teaching about these issues. Um, uh, I, for instance, uh, Today it's a bit trendy speaking sometimes about uh, uh, planning, opportunity planning or something like that. And I think that could be very dangerous at the same time. So at the same time there is a great discomfort about the idea of planning in long term. So how you can, you can take opportunities having in mind these long term objectives at the same time. So understanding the way in which those objectives are so <laughs> incarnate in, in very, very close opportunities. I think this is another uh, central, central issue we you need to, to underline. And even this issue of material and material was mentioned. I think what, what a student or even a professional should know is the way in which this object is connected with, let's say, a, a cultural or political or economical background and this, at the same time, how those political and cultural realms can produce a certain kind of objects. So this connection is, is, very, is very central, I think. It's very, it's very important. It's this kind of reading is that uh, we need to promote, in a way. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and this issue... Rahul was mentioned about urban studies and all this. Uh, 
I think it's very fascinating the way in which many disciplines like anthropology or psychology or geography or are concerned about urban realms. And this is, I think, is a big contribution. Sometimes they could be self-centered, could be, but we can take uh, advantages from them. We, we can learn from them. The way in which cities are read by <coughs> anthropologists or psychologists, I think, is a great contribution. Uh, it's not simple the way they connect with action. Sometimes it's not very simple. But I think the thing we need to build is a kind of chain of different, you know, different uh, actors which are connected in a certain way, or perhaps it's not a chain, perhaps it's a kind of network. Ecology. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And the first one is about the you may, when we think about the education in these territories, usually called global south, that is a kind of contemporary term. We we usually operate in a body that is completely different from the theories that we learn. So we um the, the few of us that we have had the luck to study abroad, we had maybe the same feeling of you coming back to Mumbai here saying like the that we, what we learned was a way of, of seeing or listening, but not necessarily a theory to apply, and the problems are very different. And so in that, in that sense, there is a lot of issues, that common issues that we need to start like engaging between like this hemisphere of what you are doing and what we are doing. But the second is about the, when we, when we think about the urbanism, uh, and we think about cities, usually the problems that the developing countries like this one is facing is not about the cities only, but about the territory. And usually the citizens are asking for solutions that has to do with the externalities of urbanization, and specifically the urban form. Today there was an insertion in the newspaper talking about the mining in detailing in Caimane, that is a small village that is near to the Italian dump of uh, almost 1,700 million tons of uh, mineral pelambis. That is like a huge problem and we just start thinking about those villages in terms of the city and the size of that object and not with the territory or the urbanization process that is happening. And the, uh, so the first one is more about listening as gentlemen is saying like how we develop theories or new ideas thinking about our own context. The second is more about understanding that the the cities is inserted in a territory that the, as doctors now are treating patients, understanding their environment, we cannot just look at the, the city and not the territory that is of the ecology of the problem. And the a specific question for you is that you represent the private school of design and a specific department that is <laughs> design and planning. It's your fault. And yesterday you, you show how free you do in your own practice like jumping from architecture, planning, urbanism, and even landscape. So you were talking about the trust pole or the field, the hard trust pole that architecture built. Uh, I would like to ask you about the, how those hard trust poles that I saw in, in the GST and the academia in general are still preserved. I think how that the academia is still preserving those trust poles and how we can educate the professional practice and education. How we can educate those future practitioners or educators inside these disciplinary walls that they will have to work with complex problems that don't have those questions. And we, we cannot just educate people in urban design without landscape, geography, <coughs> architecture, etc. So, how do you see that, that new scenario that is developing and, and in, in the place of GSD is still is being discussed? So you want the official response? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are as, as far as you can get from the GSM. That's what you're take. It gets more unofficial with direct distance from the GSM. That's right. Then you can feel like No. I blurred that boundary between the official and the unofficial. So. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, I mean, I think that's a very good question. And uh, I think one of the binaries we have to also dissolve is the urban guru, which is set up, which is linked then to the territory. 
which is what we are trying to do, and I mean, at least I'll speak more specifically because he's formulated the question in uh, some kind of official uh, response. It is, I mean, you know, for example, as bringing Neil Brenner on board, which is talking about planetary, I mean, he's challenging even the category of the city, and he's challenging the category that all our narratives are developed because we've constructed the question of the city and what are the boundaries and the territory is important to the city, it relies on the territory and the impact of the city on the territory and vice versa. So we're absolutely addressing that question. And this goes back to Fernando Singh, we want to, and now I might go into a bit of a spiel about what's happening in the department, which is what might help you with this question. First of all, you know, I mean, I think each discipline has um, its own anxieties about its discipline, partly that comes from commercial vested interests and the ways it make people who can get jobs as urban designers, as landscape architects, so, which is what you were saying, capacity to apply versus capacity to get a job. So that's one question. And so therefore at the GSC what happens is you have the core where some of these questions are addressed, but then your options are GSC wide and all option studios, which is 50% of your time is integrated because you're in studios of landscape or urban planning or architecture <coughs> and your students from everywhere. So hopefully that through that osmosis, some learning sort of gets dissipated. But what we've particularly done in the department, which I think uh, picks up on what Fernando says, is in the last three years, the, the three senior hires we've done is from geography, from sociology, and from public health, uh, uh, to bring those debates into uh, the questions of planning, to create this broader uh, ecology that uh, he was referring to, for the same reasons that uh, we were talking about. So I think a combination of spreading those disciplines and creating this kind of ecology uh, which sensitizes even the design students to these different lenses uh, with a combination of trying to create through the studios and the coursework and offering across different matrices and different geographies and different modes of engagement hopefully creates I think uh, uh, a capacity, a sensitivity <coughs> and a confidence among the students to probably um, you know, engage with these multiple problems, but also be sensitive to the idea that uh, design culture is ready. And just out of your interest, because you're also talking about pedagogy, in the last two, three years <coughs> in the urban design program, because some of you have been in the urban design program, the fundamental shift that we made, and this might be just interesting for you all, is we've tightened the core even more, because it's a postgraduate program. So in the first semester, we have a three-legged stool, as I describe it. So the students all have to do three classes. One is they do a pro seminar, which is their exposure to theory. <coughs> uh, and so they go through all the classic texts, the new texts, the different theoretical constructions for the people <coughs> that you outlined about how they can go between action and knowledge. Yeah? That becomes the critical organizing principle of the curriculum. So the pro seminar delivers the theoretical component, it's around the table, so people engage, people bring their anxieties, their confusions, they share, they get to know each other, they get perspectives from different geographies with the students are from everywhere, and in all of that. The second course that they have to do is a course that we just started three years ago, you all might have yet been around, called Cities by Design, where we get uh, different professors who have expertise in the city, so like John Busquets does Barcelona, Peter Rowe does Shanghai, I do Mumbai, someone does Detroit. We actually cover 12 cities in the whole year, and it's a four lecture course for every module, but we basically expose the students to the practice of urban design through a practitioner, like John Busquets. So he shares his reading, he talks, we give them eight points to cover, which go all the way from social and economic equity to planning cultures. Uh, and iconic buildings, what does that mean in terms of perception? But planning culture is a big part of that course. Uh, what are the different planning cultures? And so students get exposed then to the practice in different cities of what we are learning. And the third required course is the studio, the core studio, the elements of urban design, none of you have known that, which is the synthetic mode. So that it allows students to reflect on the theory, look at what practitioners are doing, but also are designing in, in the studio. So that becomes the way that we have formulated the core. In planning, we are trying to do a similar thing, but that's yet in formulation. These are slow processes because you have to work with two-year cycles mm -hmm. to make the change because of students coming in. Uh, and I mean, I just want to end by, again, referring to what Fernando was saying about the knowledge and action. And I suppose theory is important for that because theory becomes a mode of reflection. 
And that's why I think the need for us to construct those narratives, which then become theory for our particular geographies, becomes very important. Because otherwise, there's a big gap between knowledge and action. And theory becomes the only way. And I think what you were really alluding to is that what is unique about design is that it is a reiterative process, like advocacy is. So like in architecture, I always say, you design a facade, then you design the way the window is subdivided, then you zoom back to see the effect of the facade, and you go back and forth from a very small pixel to a very big image. Uh, and how do we do that for urban design? How do we do that for planning? Uh, it's much more messy and much more complex, which is why all the things you were describing have been you know, the disappointments when you go back to your urban design, because life is corroded. Uh, the project completely. I have to apologize. Yeah, I know. I know. There's a lot of people who have to apologize, and I have to leave. Yeah, thank you very yes, much. Sir. We still have ten minutes before we close, and, and and I would like to open the discussion to the audience. Uh, because, uh, I've seen that many many of the of the square table people have left, but many of you guys have stayed, and uh, and this, this idea of an open conversation. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just for us, so please feel free if anyone has a comment, question, or would like to add something. Don't be shy. We can translate. Julio, <laughs> okay. You're not from the audience, but you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was shy. Yeah. And first of all, thank you all. It was very, very interesting. Everything you saw, everything you showed us. Um, and the meanings we are discussing about uh, humanism today. Um, some reflections, uh, when we're talking about the public qualities uh, in, in human, human problem, maybe the, the public transportation is one of the issues we must uh, encourage the state to, to look at. Um, and, and the question is, which are our power, which are our um, capacities to challenge the state and understand that the, the transportation, the, the public transportation, maybe it's one of the, 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 the core of the, the Latin American and the world problem. But uh, going back to the, the teaching thing or the academic thing, um, what can be that human? Uh, it's a problem uh, that occupies too many different uh, disciplines. Sometimes I question myself if there is uh, a reason why the, the, the human studies in the preschool, I don't want to say the pre-grado, undergrad, undergrad uh, must start in the beginning of the, of the, of the career, in, in the first year, and with that uh, begin, start to uh, look at the other uh, Families of their career. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, personally, I think very much because I mean I have this difference also. You know what has happened in America, at least not in India, luckily, but in America now, um, uh, architecture training has moved into the first profession degree, which is after an undergraduate degree, it becomes a three-year program. Mm -hmm. So people come from economics, sociology, philosophy, then they come and do their first year, after three years of education, do their first architecture degree. I mean, I think that's a big problem, because when you're 17 and you start studying architecture, you develop your instincts in a different way. Mm -hmm. When you've done philosophy and you come to do architecture, you don't draw yourself out of a problem, you talk yourself out of a problem. Uh, and it's a whole different culture that people bring. For good or for bad, I don't know. But it's a different instinct. Uh, that means your intuition is different. Because it's when you're 17, 18, 19, 20, your instinct develops in a particular way. So I think for planning, it's the same thing. That if you come to urban studies, which is much more a passive uh, look uh, of observation, of observation you will never be naturally able to have the instinct of commitment, of uh, making propositional thinking. Uh, it's very difficult. I, this is a personal feeling. People might totally disagree because there are other advantages. So I think design is something where you're, it's synthetic in the sense that I think somebody said here, it's, you take many forces and you make something out of it. So it is very synthetic. I won't use the word intuitive because intuition has other implications, but it's synthetic. So how do we both in urban planning, if we want to be speculative and propositional, 
uh, in urban design, in architecture, if you want to be speculative, propositional, uh, and therefore have to really empower students to operate the synthetic qualities uh, of synthesizing things at a very high level, you have to do it when people are young, I, I believe. Otherwise, you form a culture of economics or geography or philosophy. And truly, I think it's no coincidence in my mind that when America shifted 10, 15 years ago to this system, you had more people writing about architecture than actually designing. Okay. Uh, because it brought a whole different cultural shift to it. Um. <coughs> I have, I mean, I think it's been a fantastic and interesting um, um, discussion. There's one thing that still sort of uh, I, I cannot um, let pass, which is like the, the images of Kumela. I think it's absolutely mind-boggling. I think nobody, nobody here has seen anything like that. Uh, I can only imagine what it must have been to actually stay there for a couple of days. Um, yesterday you show a quote I cannot, I did not, um, Wrote down. I did not write down who was the, the quote from, um, but it was about. It said something like, "Tactics is knowing what to do when there is something to do. And strategy is knowing what to do when there is nothing to do." And, and I've been listening to this discussion, and I, I wonder, in, in, in the context of Kumbela and the ephemeral city, um, we discuss how academia engages with scale, with size, with function, with materiality and immateriality. Uh, I think there's two things that are completely out of place in this discussion and are the, the, sort of the elephant in the room, and it's temporality. And you brought two, two of the two exponents of that scale. <coughs> On one hand, the ephemeral city, 100 million people, 50 days, and it disappears, completely unheard of. On the other hand, what has happened to the GSD, which is the let's say the emergence of the landscape architecture program as, as a very strong um, um, pillar of, of the education of the GSD these days, <coughs> which brings the other extreme, which is how do we actually design or think century-long design strategies? We're not talking about 50 days, we're talking about, you know, James Corner's designs talk about, you know, what happens in 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, kind of thing. Um, so my question is, this is a dimension that we as designers, we have been trained as architects or as urbanists to deal with scale, with object, with size, with social conditions, but we've never been trained, and I don't think anybody's training people for this massive gap in the terms of temporal scale. So my question is, how well do you think academia is, from, from the GSD perspective or from, from the, your experience in India, how well it keeps academia to deal with these conditions that are so completely distorted? No, no, excellent. Thanks for asking that question, but I'm going to put your question on hold for one minute because I want to go back to transportation. Because we this <laughs> uh, I think that was also a very important question, and I think uh, my response to that is be that I think we have lost, and this is through the state's role, but also planning and all of that, we have lost the, the narrative on the importance of infrastructure as mobility because, uh, and we've lost the sense of articulating its relationship to urbanization generally. For example, uh, transportation, if we talk about the state engagement with planning, transportation is the best form of indirect subsidy on housing. Uh, because when you directly subsidize housing, you get a lot of problems, which is what America has fallen into. You get social housing, you get ghettos. But when you indirectly subsidize housing by making transportation cheap, you can get fantastic patterns because you can open up land, people can invest themselves, uh, etc. and you don't fall into the suburban mode. So this interrelationship about how mobility gets embedded in this discourse is, I think, the critical question. And the relationship to housing is the most important thing, which I think, I mean, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, a lot of attention was paid on it. But somehow, when the state got less involved everywhere around the world in the neoliberal kind of formulation, this became something that I think a generation will forget mm. unless we bring it back as a very serious mm. part of the discussion. So thank you, Jasal. Now on the temple, that's a really interesting, but, I mean, fantastic question. And I think time is just not factored into planning. Uh, what is also not factored into planning is transition. And it's not even factored into landscape. I think in landscape urbanism, the uh, time factor has 
come in as, to my mind at least, I might be wrong, people here might know better, as a linear construct. Yes, so how will this evolve in 150 years? And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this in, in true sincerity. I, I think that's a very narrow dimension of that expansion because it doesn't factor in people, it doesn't factor in politics, it doesn't factor in culture. It, it, sees, uh, almost, it sees landscape as dynamic, but, um, but yet controlled, and therefore it is a linear imagination of time. Now, in planning, we've also been caught in the notion of end state planning, which means we imagine the end state. Uh, and uh, even if it's 150 years down the line, in landscape, we do the same thing. We're imagining, even though we spread it over 150 years, we're imagining an end state, which is the biggest problem. Because, we, yeah, the final end. Because transitions is the key question to talk about temporality, because transitions is that scenarios, many things could play out, you know, and sometimes transitions are, so let me use the example of India. Uh, one of the hot political questions in India when George W. Bush uh, visited India four or five years ago, when our relationships with America were fantastic, now they're terrible, uh, uh, was that he went to make a nuclear deal with Manmohan Singh, who was our prime minister, and everyone freaked out, why are we going nuclear? But if you think about it, and it's a real risk that India, with a billion people, uh, could not go to renewables, which is where I think we are committed as a society to go, unless we went to nuclear first, because we can't make the jump from fossil fuels to renewable. Then our economy would collapse completely when we are a billion people. So from fossil fuels, we are going to nuclear to go to renewable. Now that is a complicated transition. And sometimes in urban planning, we have to imagine things. We, we imagine them as if that's so your disappointment of seeing the mess when you go back comes from partly us imagining a linear path to an end condition. Sometimes the transition takes you to a direction which is completely different from where you're going. Now, how do we imagine this? We don't even have the language to describe this. And temporality, to my mind, is linked to this question of transition. And I think we have to talk about, and so scenario planning is one attempt to do that because you build scenarios based on changeable political conditions, changeable economic conditions, and you might go here and there. And so it's a messy game, it will be risky, it's like playing what is popular here, the slot machines. Sometimes <laughs> things might not line, line up, but they might line up. But I think that's part of creating the shelf of ideas because the more scenarios we create, the more we'll be equipped for messy transitions. And I think messy transitions eventually give you the most sustainable kinds of environments. And then temporality becomes one factor in the imagination of transitions. That's how we, I would conceptualize it. And we can talk, this is a conversation to be continuous. Great. <laughs> right. Thank you, yes, I'm gonna leave it for, uh, we're out of time. You're so. giving him the last word. <laughs> 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 Please uh, go ahead, but before, because he's an end, just thank you everyone, especially the guests who were uh, coming today for the discussion. But as, as he did a pause, you know, <laughs> 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 pause. Uh, just to answer to that, it, it just was coming into my head right now, and with all the risk of speaking out loud that, um, there is a, what, the question, why do you go to the final product and, mm -hmm. and don't move yeah. through the process? Um, and I think that it, it, it comes to my head that it's a little bit because uh, academia sees the art world, the city, or the urban or the territory, or whatever, um, as, 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 a, as something ill, as illness. You know? So we have uh, expert diagnosis and all that. And, and you, we speak out. Uh, I mean, we're, it's quite just, and, and we're trying to ask the right questions and so on. Because we say, okay, we're here in the academia because out there there's some problems. You know? And that the academia is like in a hospital in a certain way, with a bunch of doctors that we have a patient, the patient is outside, but uh, we're playing that, a, a little bit of that role. But on the other side of the table, the young world sees the academia as a place where visions should happen, uh, with transition, with time, and all that. So it's, it's also like a, 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 a dialogue that goes through different sidewalks, in a certain, in the, on the same street, but on different sidewalks. The, because at the end, at, up to which point are we shaping our programs and the academy and the research uh, towards that sense of illness, or not towards that sense of, of building up to the place, academia is the place where visions should uh, stand up or emerge or be constructed and, um, and uh, 
and things like that, you know. And then uh, you can ask, we can ask ourselves, okay, maybe uh, one key thing to designers is to then understand the theory of Pareto. You know, that whatever you do as a, as a process of design or planning or whatever, everybody has to gain. And then you might, uh, you know, and, and sort of things like that that could change the paradigm also of, of doing, of seeing your subject not as an illness only, uh, not as something that has problems and that has symptoms and you have to solve those symptoms, uh, but also um, a place that you have to do a, a, a lead job in a certain way. So, I, I don't know, it, it just came to my head. I tell you what the Chinese doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Better than that. coughs> Well, well, was that that came up my head just now? And um, I wanted, I asked Marcella two minutes just to close. I think this has been um, a, very much for me a very magical moment. Uh, uh, I think that very few times uh, we come together in in Chile uh, to talk uh, about these matters. Very few times we see our faces mm -hmm. together in a in a room. That, that's true, and and you have made that possible in a certain way. Uh, because they wouldn't come if me and Pablo are talking. Marcela. So I think I think that we need uh, a lot of that internal dialogue in academy in a certain way. I've been very happy to meet Jonathan in a, in a couple of meetings around there, uh, seeing possible uh, projects and research together and stuff like that. And I think that we are. This is a much richer and complex uh, country in terms of the academy than it is uh, four years uh, before or five years or whatever years before. And we need as academy actually to, to catch up in, into that um, and, and, and start you know, having a lot of the interaction. And I think that that is, is, is something that we're really lacking. And um, I will, I'd like to, to say uh, thank you to every one of you that came here. Uh, thank you to Pablo because all this happened in a meeting in your office uh, that Felipe uh, caught uh, us there and uh, we were able to convince you somehow, maybe you were with a huge jazz act, to come to Chile and not only that, now to go to Calama. But I'm really very uh, um, touched about what the, the, the talk has gone on and and, and uh, the interchange of ideas has gone on here. Um, and I will only ask to every one of the participants actually uh, to take up the initiative and start building uh, discussions, start building network, start building research as this. Uh, or, I mean, beginning from here on, uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. One of the things I'm, I'm absolutely convinced is that any uh, illness or any vision that we will try to uh, deconstruct or construct in a certain way will not come from a single effort at all uh, and we need to in a certain way start to build up knowledge and build up academia um, and um, I, I thank you for let us being able to give our first step or our intermediate step or whatever. Thank you very much. Thanks.